Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody to our illustrious College of Complexes meeting tonight, where Todd's going to be talking about Green America. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. The first one, the first part is our is just a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak for up to about an hour or so. And then we'll have our question and answers period, followed by our infamous rebuttal period where we can talk about the topic on or off topic. You'll each get a small specified amount of time for those who want to speak. And so it'll be wrapped up by Todd's uh, final remarks. Generally, we go till about nine o'clock or so. And uh, if we go a little longer, it's since we're on Zoom and we're not under the constraints of the restaurant, we can do that. And of course, you know, it's always uh, quite something um, I, again, I would like to uh, thank everybody. So if we have announcements now, Charlie, go ahead and uh, take it away and I'll share the schedule on, on um, uh, Zoom when you're ready. All right. I want to welcome everyone to meeting number 3,634 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, first of all, as always, I mentioned we have a relatively new Google email group and a meetup group. If you want to get one or two emails per week uh, with information on the upcoming program. On Charlie, Saturday. how can I get out of that group? Unsubscribe. I can do it. I can do it. Thank right. you. So we, uh, September 25th, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for next week's program. Um, uh, author, Michael C. Comerford, and he traveled 2,500 miles around the United States and interviewed 100 people and how, what they were, how they were dealing with the pandemic. So. We're going to be talking about how you people are dealing with the pandemic. Following that, on October the 2nd, I see she's here tonight, uh, Jan Lee will talk about a taste of Taoism or Taoism, whichever you prefer. Uh, so we're going to study uh, one of the major uh, religions uh, of China. So it should, I've seen the presentation and she covers a variety of issues and topics. It's very interesting. Uh, she's even traveled back home to a Taoist temple and tell us about her adventures there. Following that, we've got October the 9th and the 30th. I talked to them today. The Illinois Green Party will presenting their two other candidates who have been nominated to run for office in the state of Illinois. And that'll, that'll be coming up. I'll be posting that shortly, uh, October 9th and 30th. In the meantime, there's a link there uh, in which you can join, join the Illinois Green Party, which I recommend everyone does, as I did many, many years ago to advance ecological issues uh, in the city of Chicago and state of Illinois. Uh, and glad I did. And I recommend it to you. On October the 23rd. You mean October 16th? Oh, October 16th. Uh, we're gonna have a criminologist uh, from DuPage College. Uh, Will be, this is a very interesting topic. It's going to be talking about fraud prevention in person, over the phone, and online. And this has crept up with some, uh, to some degree uh, with the COVID situation. Uh, I've, as I explained earlier, I've gotten two calls warning me that about my social security unless I contacted somebody, which is fraudulent. Anyhow, that's October the 16th. On October the 23rd, conspiracy theorist 
Jim Fitzer will be returning. Oh, ho, ho, ho. He's going to tell us the accurate version, according to him, about <laughs> masks and lockdowns and Ooh. tests and vaccines. And so we're going to revisit the entire issue from uh, his perspective uh, on the issue. Uh, the next open dates, uh, we have four dates in November, <laughs> November 6, 13, 20, and 27. So if you'd like to get on the schedule, uh, it sometimes fills up very quickly. I'm running a notice now on social media. So if you'd like to tell us about uh, your organization or to discuss a social issue is like, like uh, she was talking about the military, it'd be a catalyst to the conversation. We would welcome you. So four open dates and that's it, Tim, take it away. All right. Uh, I've also got a little bit of announcement since we do have people from the Dallas campus that have been joining us. We do have a college of complexes campus that meets in Dallas on Thursday nights. Um, trying to remember where the Dallas link is. The Texas campus from the main homepage, they're having as of uh, the 23rd open forum, Texas Rebellion, the Dacronian Actions of the Republican-led legislature. And their next open date is Thursday, September 30th. And I must put in a word for Jeon. She spoke last Thursday to our college in Dallas on Taoism. And when is she speaking in Chicago? I want to let a friend know. Um, October 2nd. October 2nd is good. I'll let my friend know. Did okay. you hear what happened with those Texans in New York City that well, tried to get in the restaurant? Oh, yes. Isn't that, that sounds typical. And they, didn't know, they weren't unvaccinated and they couldn't get in, so they beat up. I know. That, the waitress, they beat her up. Yeah. That's All right. All right. Hooligans. Hooligans. All right, Charlie, let's. Uh, Move on. If there's any other announcements for the good of the uh, college, speak now, if you'd like, since it is a brief announcements time. If not, uh, Todd, if you're ready to speak, uh, share your screen and the forum is now yours. So uh, go ahead. Hey, hello, well, uh, thanks everyone for the invite this evening. Um, Happy to be talking to the College of Complexes and uh, congratulations on reaching over 3,600 meetings. That's pretty cool. Uh, I know you've been going on since the 1950s, I thought I saw on the website, that's pretty neat. So um, I'll be talking about Green America today. Um, I'm Todd Larson, I'm the Executive Co-Director for our Consumer and Corporate Engagement at Green America. And the organization goes back to the 1980s and I've been working there since the late 1990s. So for a little over 20 years, I've been at Green America. So Green America, we call ourselves the nation's leading green economy organization. And what we mean by that is that we work to build an economy that works for all people on the planet. Uh, all of our work takes place with consumers, businesses, and investors. Uh, so we don't generally work with the government directly at the state or local level. We really work directly with market actors to try and create a greener world. The organization was founded in 1983. At the time, nobody was talking about green businesses or green consumption. It was kind of a niche thing. Um, and our founder, Paul Freundlich, who's in the picture on the top, there's a black and white photo there. He's the guy with the glasses who's kneeling on the left. He uh, started the organization um, by traveling around the country by bus and talking to green businesses all over the country and trying to find out what they were needing. Uh, and like, how could they thrive? How could they grow? How can there be more green businesses in the country? But all of them said back is we actually need customers because I don't know if people are buying green product. It's hard to actually run a business that's truly green. It's like respecting the environment, respecting your workers. It's not easy to do this. So uh, he started a catalog. So it was a catalog of green products from a whole bunch of businesses across the country. 
catalog went out to consumers. They ordered things uh, before computers. So they actually wrote their order out and mailed it in. <laughs> And then we fulfilled it. Um, so we did that for a number of years. We had a catalog. Uh, and then after that, we actually started to grow rapidly. Um, we moved on from having a catalog because the number of green businesses grew. There's now 2,500 of them that we've certified as truly green. Uh, we just basically direct people to them online. Of course, at this point, people buy from those businesses directly, a whole range of products from clothing to architectural services to investing services, you name it. There's somebody doing green work. Uh, and so people can support those truly green businesses that way. Uh, we've also grown a lot in terms of our consumer education work. If you go to our website, you can find thousands of articles about how to green your life, how to green your spending, how to green your money, anything you want to know about being green, you can find it on our website. Uh, we've also done a lot of corporate gains in the last 20 years, so trying to get large corporations to actually improve their practices. And the last eight years or so, we've moved on to doing supply chain work with large corporations, so we help big businesses in food and agriculture in electronics and banking, we help them actually figure out how to be greener throughout their entire supply chain to benefit people on the planet as well. And for Green America, we always mean uh, green means environment and social justice. So we always twin together, uh, benefiting the planet while also benefiting people as well. Uh, you can see here's our mission our vision for the world. We are trying to create a world where everybody has enough, all communities are safe, and the abundance of the earth is preserved for all generations to come. As you probably all know, that's currently not the case. We are actually using far more resources than the planet can actually sustain, um, and climate change is also putting tremendous stress on human civilization and the planet. So our work is really cut out for us and everybody who works in this area. Uh, in terms of what makes us unique, <laughs> it really is that integration of social justice and environmental values. We're always uh, looking out for consumers, communities, uh, workers, and the environment all at the same time. We do only generally work in marketplace solutions. So trying to move the dial with consumers um, using their spending power to change the way businesses actually make products and try and move those companies in a greener direction and reward the companies that actually really are green. And, you know, we do have that interconnection of the consumer business and supply chain Maybe strategies. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Oh. All right, who's... Uh... Put the mute on. Okay. okay. Yeah. Somebody All may right. have dialed in and be on the computer at the same time. <laughs> Uh, that usually creates the echo. Is the echo resolved? Okay. Uh... Uh, one thing you can do is uh, if you're not talking, if you mute, then usually the echo goes away. And then when you want to talk again, obviously it's not mute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks everybody for muting. I'll, uh, I don't exactly mute, but I got an off switch in my mic. So. I'll be listening. Cool. I think I took care of the echo, everyone. So we'll just keep going. All right. So at Green America, we do, we do work in several areas. Uh, and those are climate and clean energy. So we do have a real focus on climate change and how to move the country in a cleaner energy direction. Uh, regenerative food and agriculture, uh, which is a way to grow food that actually nourishes soil health. So we preserve soil for future generations and it also sequesters carbon. We do work in finance. We work with uh, individuals to try and get them to move their money to socially responsible banking and investing options. Uh, we also work with financial institutions as well to get them to decarbonize their portfolios so they move their investments and banking out of fossil fuels and into things like renewable energy. We've had a long standing focus on labor justice. Uh, so we do work to boost worker rights around the world. Um, and we've been long time proponents of fair trade, for example, also fair labor practices. And we also do a tremendous amount of education, as I mentioned about. Next. 
I'll talk a little bit about our work uh, in addressing the crisis. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the broad outline of what's going on with climate change. Um, what's surprising to everybody who works on climate change is how fast it's actually accelerated and the impacts that we're seeing now. Uh, 20 years ago, when I started this work, scientists were predicting that the kind of effects we're seeing now would happen more like in 2040 or 2050. So um, they actually underestimated how much impact human-caused uh, climate emissions were actually going to have on the planet. But as we're all seeing, <laughs> temperatures are much higher. So we're seeing those intense wildfires, both in the United States and all over the world. Uh, flooding is more prevalent throughout the United States, both on the coast where you'd expect it, but also in the Midwest, uh, which is devastating farming communities. We are seeing glaciers melt, particularly in the northern part of the world. And permafrost is rapidly now unfreezing. So permafrost, particularly in Russia, has started to become completely destabilized and is releasing methane into the atmosphere. And that methane is actually furthering climate change as well. So we are seeing what uh, scientists predicted. Um, we're just seeing it faster than even they thought it would happen. You're probably also all familiar with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN body that actually brings together uh, scientists from around the world and choose reports on climate change. Uh, this is one of their more recent reports, um, and it talks about how we need to hold the Earth at 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming in order to keep the worst impacts of climate change from happening. In order to do that, we have to cut pollution by 45% by 2030. Unfortunately, uh, we're actually increasing carbon and methane pollution uh, in the last few years. It's not actually decreasing. So we're actually way off track with what the UN is uh, calling for. Um, UN just issued a report on Friday talking about how far off track we actually are and how bad it's actually going to be by the year 2100 if we don't get on track. Um, we could hit a warming of four degrees Celsius by the end of this century if that were to happen. The effects would actually be completely catastrophic for human civilization. It's not like the planet would come to an end or life on the planet would come to an end. That's not what will happen. But what, will, but what would happen is that civilizations around the planet, uh, all the systems that we rely on as humans are going to be undermined and there's going to be a lot of people who are not going to be able to survive in a planet of this much warming. Um, so that's why we really need to act now on climate change. It is possible to, you know, actually keep warming to something like 1.5 degrees Celsius if we try and we act fast. And our role at Green America is to try and get consumers, businesses, and investors to move fast on climate change. Also, we will point out that climate change is an equity issue. So as you can see from another United Nations report, the wealthiest people in the world and the wealthiest nations in the world are the ones who produce the most climate emissions. And so that includes uh, us as residents of the United States who have a really high carbon footprint. Um, so you can see the wealthiest 1% really need to reduce their emissions by 97%. <laughs> and the wealthiest 10%, which includes most upper middle class folks, um, would need to reduce their emissions by that 91%. And that's so that the people who are poorest in the world, the bottom 50% in terms of assets, can increase uh, their emissions and actually obtain a living income and a life that works for them. So we really need to cut back on climate change, both because we care about the future, but also because it's just completely inequitable that we in the United States have such high emissions when other people are struggling to get by. So Green America, um, our focus on climate, we have a few areas where we actually put our energies. One is on electricity and moving to clean energy. We also do some work with industry, which I'll talk a little bit about. And we also work on agriculture, which I mentioned with regenerative agriculture. So we work in several of the areas here of this pot chart. Obviously electricity is one of the largest sources of emissions. And we've been working on that for about 20 years. Uh, in the earlier part of the century, uh, most of our work was to fight coal-fired power plants from being built because, believe it or not, 20 years ago, 
In the US, there was proposals to build over 200 new coal-fired power plants in the United States. Uh, if that had actually happened, it would have been catastrophic, both for climate change, but also uh, for human health uh, in those local communities where those plants would be built, as well as in mining communities. Um, so we joined with a number of allies and were effective in helping to stop a number of those coal-fired power plants across the country. Unfortunately, the United States then shifted largely to natural gas as a bridge solution between uh, coal and a renewable future. Natural gas isn't that much better than coal. Uh, the methane emissions from natural gas because of leaks at the wells, along the pipelines, and also at the end user are pretty considerable. And that methane is driving uh, global warming at a pretty rapid rate and also producing local pollution. Um, <clears throat> the natural gas is definitely not the solution. Um, and they harm local communities and create climate change. So we've always focused our uh, efforts on trying to move us rapidly to a renewable future. Our campaigns over the last 10 years after we <coughs> worked to stop coal-fired power plants have really focused mostly on getting large corporations to adopt renewable energy goals. So one of those is Amazon. I'm sure you're all familiar with Amazon. We tend to all order from Amazon especially during the pandemic. Um, Amazon uh, uses a huge amount of energy, actually. Um, and that's for all of their servers. They also, in addition to being a shopping site, they run something called Amazon Web Services, which is the largest web hosting company in the world. And they host their own stuff, obviously, but also things like Netflix, US government programs are hosted on AWS. They are you know, a huge energy user because of all the websites that they're actually hosting. And so just for their web hosting, they used as much energy as all the households in San Francisco. So it's pretty big. Um, so when we looked at Amazon back in 2014, they are actually using absolutely no clean energy. They just bought energy off the grid and didn't worry where it came from. Um, so we started a campaign against them back in 2014. The day we launched the campaign saying that Amazon needed to move to 100% clean energy, they created a vague announcement saying that one day they would get to 100% clean energy, but they couldn't provide a timeline. Uh, they couldn't tell anybody when, but someday they would actually do it. <laughs> so that was obviously not good enough. You actually need a timeline uh, and goals. Uh, if you're actually gonna accomplish anything. So we got tens of thousands of consumers to put pressure on them. We worked with investors who hold Amazon shares and got them to put pressure on Amazon and ultimately their employees. Uh, first hundreds of their employees and then thousands of their employees called on Amazon to move to a renewable energy future a couple of years ago. As a result of all the pressure Amazon did get on board with renewable energy, they're at about 60% renewable energy across all their operations now. So that's their web hosting and all their uh, development centers and so forth are at about 60% renewable energy. They're now planning to reach 100% renewable energy by 2025. Uh, the company's also announced that it's going to be net zero carbon neutral by 2040, although it's a little vague as to how they're planning to get there. There is a, a lot of detail there that needs to be worked out, and we need to make sure they do it in a way where they're not budging and uh, actually you know, using things like carbon offsets in a way that doesn't really get you to net zero. But there is a pledge, at least, that we can hold them to and push them to move to renewable energy and change their entire transportation network for our delivering all of their goods and so forth and work on all their supply chains that they work with uh, to try and radically reduce their carbon footprint. Um, and their carbon footprint is enormous. They have about the same carbon footprint as the nation of Denmark. So it's like a small country, Amazon. And also Amazon has finally begun to disclose some of its environmental impacts. They were a very closed company for years. They didn't tell anyone what their environmental impacts were or what they were doing about them. In the last couple of years, they've started to make uh, a number of announcements and share information that helps get a better understanding of their entirety of their impacts and what they're doing about them. This has all come about because there's been consumer pressure, media pressure, investor pressure, and their own employees are putting pressure on them. So it definitely works to put pressure on a large company like this. 
After we started making progress with Amazon, we actually moved on to the telecommunications sector. Uh, this sector also uses enormous amounts of energy. Uh, currently, these companies, the four biggest ones, Sprint, T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon, they use about all as much power as the city of New York. So it's a lot of energy that they're using. That's actually going to go up because as they move from 4G networks, which our cell phones now operate on, to the new 5G networks, those networks use a tremendous amount of energy, a lot more energy than 4G. The benefit of 5G, obviously, is it's a lot faster, uh, so you can do a lot more with it, but it is much more energy intensive. So it's essential that we move these companies to renewable energy as well. So when we started this campaign in 2018, <clears throat> uh, most of these companies weren't using any renewable energy, or if they were, it was less than 2%. And so we tried talking to them first to explain, you know, some of other large companies like Apple and, uh, you know, uh, Google have commitments to get to 100% renewable energy. Uh, they're doing it already. There's no reason why you can't move to it either. And it's getting more affordable to do so. Um, the only company that took us up on that offer was T-Mobile, and they promptly made a commitment to get to 100% renewable energy, solar and wind uh, only, uh, by 2021. So this year, by the end of the year, they'll have contracts in place. They'll be 100% renewable powered. <coughs> um, after that, we really put a lot of attention on AT&T and Verizon because they're the two largest companies. We did a lot of campaigns on them. We did consumer pressure, media, investor pressure, all the usual things that we do. And they started to make commitments. So AT&T has made some of the largest corporate purchases of renewable energy in the world over the last few years. It still only has gotten them to someplace between 25 and 30% renewable energy, but it's a big change from less than 2%. And Verizon is now committed to 50% renewable energy. And I think they're at about 40% right now. Uh, so they've grown pretty rapidly in their use of renewables, but still have a ways to go. It's probably on this sprint is merging with T-Mobile. That merger went through this year. Uh, they now also have a 100% renewable commitment, and they're at 30% right now. So we're going to keep the pressure on these companies. The other thing we're doing with both these companies and Amazon is as they adopt renewable energy, we're asking them to do so in a way that actually benefits local communities. So doing uh, purchasing agreements and contracts where uh, the folks who are actually providing the clean energy are doing so in a way that is actually uh, in harmony with the communities where those uh, solar plants or those uh, wind farms are being placed, making sure there's quality jobs that are being created, and also working to make sure that those jobs are diversifying because solar and wind is not terribly diverse uh, in terms of hiring. Uh, there's a lot of white men who work for these companies, but uh, they're underrepresented in terms of women and people of color uh, at these companies. They're so asking them to look at that as well. So this way, as they ramp up solar and wind across the country, uh, they can also do so in a way that benefits local communities, workers, and a diverse range of people. So as we've made progress with large corporations on uh, moving to renewable energy, <laughs> uh, we've also started to focus on another major climate, climate emitter, which is refrigerants. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, refrigerants are actually one of the major drivers of climate change, and most people don't really think of them that way. Um, back you know, in the 70s and 80s, the problem with refrigerants, which were called CFCs, those chemicals were actually going up into the air, and you probably remember that was destroying the ozone layer. Uh, so there was a call to eliminate CFCs. The Montreal Protocol was put into place. It was largely successful, and CFCs have uh, diminished considerably since then and are hardly used anymore. And that has actually protected the ozone layer, so it was a success. They were replaced with something called HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. Those chemicals do not damage the ozone layer, but they do create enormous amounts of global warming. And it's uh, incredible, um, the global warming potential of HFCs 
maybe up to 9,000 times that of carbon dioxide itself. So these are one of the most potent climate gases out there. And they often leak. So systems that use these HFCs, both residential, commercial, and in things like uh, you know, supermarkets and stores, there's a lot of leakage. And that leakage is helping to really drive climate change. So one of the major solutions out there to climate change is to move off of these uh, refrigerants to alternatives. And the alternatives are things like actually CO2 itself, also ammonia-based refrigerants, which don't have much global warming potential, and also to stop the leaks. So as you can see here, um, refrigerants have been identified as a top climate solution. If you've ever read Project Drawdown, which is an excellent uh, book um, and also a website that you can go to, the top 100 climate solutions, refrigerants is one of the top climate solutions there. And there's good reason for that, because if we can move off of uh, these uh, terrible refrigerants that are actually uh, creating global warming, we could prevent half a degree of warming, uh, which is an enormous reduction in global warming. Our particular focus at Green America is actually on the supermarket sector. Uh, because their leak rates are so high. So a lot of supermarkets are leaking a quarter of the refrigerants every year. That's 45 million metric tons of uh, refrigerant leaked every year, about 10 million cars on the road equivalent in terms of you know, global warming potential there. So it's big. Um, and there's a lot of things that these supermarkets could do to both reduce their leak rate and move to alternatives to those terrible HFCs. So the solutions are out there. In particular, we've been focusing on Walmart. Uh, Walmart is the largest supermarket chain in the country. Obviously, they run superstores and sell many things. But as part of every store, they're essentially a supermarket. And they're 25% of the marketplace in terms of supermarkets in the United States. Um, and if you look at Walmart's emissions profile, which they do report out on, of all the emissions that they directly control, so that are things that the company actually has direct control over, their stores, their transportation, nearly half of their emissions are actually from refrigerants. So that's uh, you know half compared to all the energy they use in their stores, all of the fuel they use in their own trucks and so forth. Uh, HFCs actually dwarf the other sources of emissions that they put out there. This is a big problem for Walmart and something they really need to be addressing. Uh, it is 2.8 million metric tons of refrigerants they're leaking every year, uh, which is about the power of all households in San Francisco. Walmart has promised to address the issue of refrigerants, but has failed to actually follow through on any of the commitments that it's made. So we feel like they're the number one company that needs to move on this because they're so big, because they've made promises and they fail to follow through on any other promises. And you can see here from this chart, this is Walmart's own reported data on their HFC emissions. So refrigerants, they're leaking out into the atmosphere. And it's actually gone up from 2005 overall to 2017, which is the last year they reported out on. The other reason we're putting so much pressure on Walmart is there are some companies out there at, that run supermarkets that are actually doing the right thing. And you can see some of them here. Uh, Aldi is actually a leader in the United States, it's actually a German company. They have stores all over the US, however. Um, and they use a lot of uh, alternatives to HFCs in their stores and have low leak rates. Target has done a lot of good work in their stores. Whole Foods, which is actually a subsidiary of Amazon at this point, has actually done a lot of good things. So there are a number of supermarkets that are actually doing the right thing in the US, showing that it is totally possible to do so. It's financially, you know, they're financially able to do it and there's good payback on it. So we really need to put pressure on Walmart to move a lot faster um, because we don't really have time for them to keep dragging their heels on this important issue when their emissions are having such a big impact. So I was gonna talk a little bit about some of the other work that we do at Green America. In addition to um, energy work and refrigerants, we also do a lot of work on 
uh, textiles and clothing. And that's because of the huge impact that the textile industry has on the planet and also on the people who work in textile factories. So as you can see from the slide, 10% of global emissions comes from the fashion industry alone. That's gone up over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, it's actually an increasing footprint. And you know, a lot of times people don't realize how carbon intensive fashion is. When you think of emissions, you might think, oh, well, airplanes are probably one of the biggest emitters out there. Uh, but fashion's much larger than something like airplanes. So airplanes are about 3% of our emissions, uh, air travel, uh, whereas obviously uh, apparel is about three times as high as that. But also textile manufacturing is also highly polluting. <clears throat> so 20% of all industrial water pollution in the world uh, from manufacturing comes from textiles. And that's because it is a very chemical intensive process. And one of the problems and one of the reasons why this has become such a big issue is that the amount of clothing that Americans and other wealthier people around the world are buying is actually increasing. So we buy dramatically more clothing than we did just 20 years ago. And that's uh, a clothing production double in a very short period of time uh, from 50 billion units per year to 100 billion units per year of clothing made. At the same time, we don't hold on to our clothing very long anymore. So in the past, people used to buy clothing and actually wear it for years. Uh, we've actually turned clothing into something that's relatively disposable in the United States. So we buy things, wear them for a while or never, and then dispose of them. And unfortunately, we really are disposing of them. <laughs> a lot of it's going to landfill. As you can see from the slide, about over 60% of it just gets straight to landfill. Uh, some of it goes to incinerators. Um, hardly any of it's actually getting recycled or reused. And that's really unfortunate because um, there's a huge amount of carbon embedded in each piece of clothing. There's all those chemicals that were used. Um, and for it to be used for a short period of time by us as end consumers and disposed of is really just a terrible use of resources. So one of our primary focuses with all of this information is really the chemicals that are used in the apparel sector. We both educate people to actually change their consumption patterns around clothing. We're also working directly with apparel companies to try and reduce the chemicals that they're using because it's such a big issue. Uh, as you can see, the apparel industry uses about 43 million tons of chemicals every year. So it's one of the most chemical intensive industries in the world. And that's across the entire supply chain of manufacturing clothing. So uh, when you actually grow cotton to go into the shirts that we wear and other clothing, um, that cotton is generally treated with large quantities of pesticides. Some of the largest uh, amounts of pesticides used on any crop in the world are used on cotton. Uh, so that's a very chemical intensive process right there. It's also carbon intensive, water intensive. Uh, it takes a lot of energy um, and resources and creates enormous amounts of pollution just to produce the cotton that goes into clothing. Then there's the manufacturing. So it's actually spun into fiber. Um, there's chemicals used in that process as well. It's then dyed. There's a tremendous number of chemicals that are used uh, in that process as well. And those harm workers and also the surrounding communities in a lot of places around the world uh, you can actually see waste pipes from dying facilities dumped straight into the drinking water of communities that so go straight into the rivers that people actually use to sustain their lives. <clears throat> and then also the final product of uh, clothing is actually dust and chemicals as well. So as consumers, uh, when we actually wear the clothing, it's actually impacting our health as well. And when we wash it in our washing machines, the chemicals come out and that actually impacts our local communities as well. So there are a number of chemicals of concern in clothing. Um, and some of the major ones are listed here. You don't really need to memorize them or anything, but you know, you'll recognize some of them. Azo dyes are very common. Heavy metals are actually in clothing, like lead and mercury can actually be in clothing. 
formaldehyde, which is highly toxic, is in clothing. Um, so there are a number of chemicals, um, and these definitely impact workers the most because they're dealing with them on a daily basis, and they cause things like you know liver damage, damage to the nervous system, cancers over time, you know, problems with respiratory symptoms, <clears throat> and so the workers get the worst of it. Um, but that also impacts us as end consumers as well. So we're urging companies to move away from these highly toxic chemicals and processes. Garment work is huge around the world, not in the United States so much anymore. Uh, most of it's uh, left the United States, except there's some garment manufacturing still in the Los Angeles region and a couple other areas of the US. But for the most part, it's overseas at this point. And there's over 70 million people. Most of these folks in garment work are women. Uh, they have few rights uh, working in a garment factory. Um, there's a lot of sexual harassment in these factories. Uh, the working conditions overall are unsafe. They're often underpaid, sometimes not ever paid uh, for some of the work that they do. So it's a huge problem of uh, workers' rights in garment factories. There are also millions of children working garment factories around the world. Most of the brands that we buy from are not paying these workers a living wage. So they're making tons of profit um, by charging us you know, $50 for a shirt or $100 for a shirt. The garment workers are getting hardly any of that pennies of that money is going to them. <laughs> so it's another part of the problem is that the workers are so underpaid and are treated so poorly as well. And they're exposed to these toxic chemicals. So as you can see, occupational disease is one of the major problems in factories around the world. Um, and about 50% of those deaths are attributable to chemical exposure. Uh, of course, part of the problem is sometimes those chemical exposures don't uh, result in disease right away. So uh, you can be um, harmed by chemicals in a way that you don't actually see a cancer show up for five years or 10 years. It can be very difficult for workers to prove that their exposure to toxic chemicals in the factory is what caused their cancer. Um, so that makes it even harder for them to get companies to help pay for their medical bills and so forth. Um, so it's a huge problem for these workers. As I mentioned, the consumer, I mean, the communities surrounding garment manufacturing also run enormous risks um, because of the uh, toxic chemicals going into the water supply, the land, into the air. Um, so they're affected very much as well. <laughs> so when we started working in this issue, we actually looked at some of the major companies uh, that you could find in a mall. So we figured, well, what, which are the kinds of companies Americans buy from when they go to the mall? And how are those companies doing on things like worker rights, toxic chemicals, water issues, factory safety? Um, and what we found is that Target actually is the best um, of the major brands out there. Target does pretty well. They put a number of processes in place to manage their chemicals. They have a good understanding of who's actually manufacturing uh, their clothing and decent uh, rules around factory safety that they enforce. Um, so they're doing pretty well, actually, and they're one of the leaders out there of large companies. But as you go down the scorecard, you can see it gets worse. Um, so there's some other good companies like VF. They make things like the North Face products that uh, you buy for going hiking and stuff. Nike's pretty good in the Gap, and it just keeps getting worse and worse after that. So you see at the bottom things like Urban Outfitters, Carter's, J. Crew and Forever 21 are actually really bad around a number of these issues. So based on the information we found, we decided what we should do is put pressure on Carter's um, because Carter's is the largest uh, company selling baby clothes and kids clothes in the United States. Um, they not only sell under their own brand and also Oshkosh Degash, which is a subsidiary of theirs, they also manufacture children's clothes for Target, Walmart, and Amazon. So when you buy things from those companies, even though it doesn't say Carter's, it's probably made by Carter's or very likely to be made by Carter's. And they really had no chemical management policies or practices in place. They didn't restrict substances 
uh, that end up in the final product. So they weren't protecting their consumers and they didn't restrict uh, chemicals that workers were being exposed to. Um, and they didn't have any chemicals they were specifically banning. So when we saw all that and saw that they didn't really have practices in place to protect worker safety overall, we launched a campaign against Carter's a few years ago, uh, calling on consumers uh, to put pressure on Carter's to actually do something about this important issue. Um, and actually they've been listening uh, between the consumer pressure and the fact that we worked with investors, including New York State to put pressure on them. Um, they've actually started to put practices into place. So we're seeing uh, Carter's actually put up a website. We talk about its environmental, social, and governance impacts as a corporation. They finally did disclose a restricted substances list. And this is a uh, chemicals that they are not going to be um, present in their final product that they sell to consumers. So they're guaranteeing that those chemicals won't be in product that kids wear. And they've also issued a sustainability report for the first time this year. Um, as part of that, um, they're also committing to Oikotech certification, which is a strict certification uh, around things like chemical management for baby clothing. Um, and they're gonna be moving the baby clothing onto that certification over the next few years. These are important steps forward. Uh, there's a lot more that we can do. We do have active dialogue now with the company. We're talking with them about ways that they can implement next steps, chemicals of concern that they can eliminate. And we expect to see more progress with Carter's over the next couple of years. So with the um, progress with Carter's, we've actually now been turning our attention to Amazon. Um, Reason for that is Amazon is now the largest clothing retailer in the United States. It surpassed uh, Walmart and everybody else. They also have 80 private label brands, some of which you don't even realize are Amazon brands. So they have a, a lot of clothing of their own that they manufacture that they sell on Amazon's website in addition to a number of third-party brands. And they have huge profits. They're one of the most profitable companies in the world. And they don't have any publicly available information about chemical management for their own clothing or for any of the brands that they sell on their website. So as a consumer, you have no idea what kind of chemicals are in the clothing. How are you being protected? How are workers being protected? There's nothing going on there. <clears throat> so we're starting to call on Amazon now to end toxic textiles, as we call them, respect worker rights, protect their consumers, uh, we've just started this campaign and we anticipate it'll take a little while. Uh, Amazon is a hard company to move, but we're hoping that in the next couple of years, they start taking some of the steps that we saw Carter take. And so those are some of the corporate campaigns that we do and the progress that we've made on those, both climate change and toxic chemical management. Another piece of Green America is actually just working directly with individuals to help folks bring their lives. The thing that people most reach out to us about is how can I lower my climate footprint and uh, what can I do about climate change in general? So when we talk to people, we say, well, you know, you obviously have limited time. You should probably look at the things where you're going to get your biggest payoff in your individual life in terms of what you can do around climate change. <clears throat> so when you look at that, what you're going to see is that transportation is the biggest impact we have as individuals on climate change. So when we drive cars or take flights, those are huge impacts every year. Uh, cars are about three tons of carbon dioxide equivalent a year. Flight of transatlantic is 1.5 tons of carbon equivalent every year. So those are two of the biggest things you can do is to try to avoid flying, cut back on your use of uh, cars or move to electric vehicles. Another thing we ask people to look at is green energy for their home. because That's another big carbon impact. Um, and so there's plenty of options there in terms of putting renewable energy onto your home, solar panels. But if you can't do that, in a lot of states, you can actually choose your energy provider and you can choose to purchase your energy from a green energy company. The other one that surprises people is how much diet has an impact on climate. But if you're eating a meat-based diet and uh, you know, animal products in general, 
Uh, those have a huge carbon footprint embedded in them. So we really encourage people to move to a plant-based diet as much as they can. We realize some people they don't want to give up meat, but then we just encourage them to reduce their meat consumption and try to eat more plant-based foods. Um, the carbon footprint is dramatically lower. On it. <clears throat> so those are some of the biggest things you can do as a consumer if you want to lower your own footprint. The other actions we can take, of course, is buying less because <laughs> carbon is embedded in everything we buy. So when you manufacture a product, and I know at the beginning of this meeting, folks were talking about the steel that goes into things like cars and stuff like that, that automatically creates a carbon footprint when you buy something like a new vehicle. There's carbon embedded in that. Also, the clothing, as I mentioned earlier, has huge amounts of carbon embedded in it. Uh, we encourage people to actually do things like reuse and recycle properly. Um, there's little things you can do every day, like washing your whether it's in cold water, using LED light bulbs, pretty easy fixes and switches that you can do in your life. They have an impact and they're worth doing. And one of the things we point out to people is that greening your life does have impacts for both you and the planet that are positive. So obviously cleaner energy means cleaner air. Uh, when people start driving less, they end up walking and biking more and it's good for their health. Uh, eating more vegetables, uh, and grains, and things like that. Whole grains is actually much better for your health as well than eating meat, so it's good for you. Obviously, when you buy used clothes, they've already been washed a number of times usually, so the chemicals have been washed out of them, so you have less exposure yourself. So and then just in general, focusing less on buying stuff creates more time to enjoy life. We always tell people not to end there, um, it's good to green your life. It's good to take action to protect the planet individually. But obviously, we can't get to the speed and scale we need to, to address things like climate change if we each just act in our own individual lives. So we turn encourage people to also get involved in any way that they want. But um, obviously, you can get involved politically as a citizen or resident. Uh, right now, there's plenty of opportunities to push our federal government <laughs> Uh, with legislation that's currently be, being considered on climate change that's so important, but also at the local and state level, uh, there's so much that you can do as well. And your voice has a really big impact there. Um, for example, in the District of Columbia, it did pass a really important energy omnibus bill for clean energy uh, with 100% clean energy goal by 2032. And a large part of that was because of the pressure from their own residents and local groups urging the District of Columbia to do so. There's plenty of rallies and marches to take place in. We also encourage people who aren't into rallies and marches to instead maybe do education work, so you can use things like social media uh, to educate folks in your network about the importance of climate change and actions they can take. And of course, we encourage people to join groups like ours and putting pressure on large corporations, uh, both in terms of you know, reducing their own climate footprint and then there's other groups that are focused on the lobbying corporations too. So a lot of them say that they care about climate change, but their lobbying uh, says the exact opposite. So uh, there's plenty of actions you can take to hold corporations accountable as well. And that pressure does work. Um, as I mentioned, we're seeing large companies making these huge corporate commitments. We're seeing utilities now making commitments to things like solar and wind when they didn't before. Um, so worldwide, we're seeing a, a tremendous uh, impact in terms of how much clean energy is being installed. And in the U.S., we're also seeing a huge impact. So U.S. clean energy installation uh, tripled in just one year, 2017 to 2018. Uh, most of the new power generation capacity added worldwide in 2018 was from renewable energy. You can see in the U.S. Uh, from having almost no solar power in the U.S. 20 years ago, there's now 2 million installations in the U.S. alone. And wind has grown also tremendously as well in the U.S. So in closing, I would just recommend people take actions that motivate you the most, the issues that call out to you, um, and doing things one step at a time. Then people try to green their life and green the world all at once. That gets a little exhausting. So we encourage people to you know, pick something that they care about, 
work on that for a while, make progress, and then move on to something else. And definitely share what you're doing with your friends and families. Um, it really helps to validate that a green lifestyle and being active as a resident or citizen is really important as well. And it makes people feel less alone uh, when they're concerned about things like climate change and pollutants and so forth. I uh, encourage you to go to our website, greenamerica.org. There's several thousand pages of information there. <laughs> so uh, you can look around, do some searches, see what appeals to you. Uh, plenty of information there. Um, and I hope you, you do check that out as a resource. We're also on social media. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So you can follow us that way as well. And I think with that, I'll complete the remarks part of this evening so we can move on to the next parts. So I'm gonna stop sharing these slides and turn it back over. All right, thank you, Todd. I appreciate your presentation. It sounds like you're doing you know, quite a bit to see, uh, you know, getting these corporations accountable for usage of energy like refrigerants and everything else. Um, I'd like to know what your vision is of the future in the, and the best way to solve climate change, if you can just get on that for a brief minute. I know you're working a lot on the corporations and the supply chains and everything else, but if you were to like, give a small country, like say something in this in, in Africa, for example, what advice would you give them on how they could meet their energy needs? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, well, one thing is, um, I think a lot of countries are seeing what the United States and other developed countries are doing and figuring out how to leapfrog over the development path that they had. So they're moving straight uh, and a number of the technologies, they're moving straight to, you know, the greenest and cleanest and best technologies now, instead of going through the steps of, you know, first in the case of energy, coal-fired power plants or natural gas or what have you. Um, there's an interest in moving straight to things like renewable energy and battery storage and other storage technologies. And there's a couple of reasons for it. One of which is the declining cost of renewables. At this point, renewable energy is actually cheaper than other sources of energy out there. Um, it's distributed. So you can actually build out an energy infrastructure and do it in a way with like microgrids where it's like a resilient local grid that can be operated um, on its own separate from a national grid. Uh, or it can be connected into a national grid, but it still offers you more resilience than the way we built the United States grid, which is showing its age and is not terribly resilient at this point. Um, so you can, you can get that advantage as well. Uh, you can also uh, benefit local communities through the control of their own energy production through renewable energy. So there's a ton of advantages, both social and environmental, uh, to doing energy the right way. Um, in terms of climate change overall, it is really a multifaceted solution that we have to have. Uh, it's not just about energy, although that really matters and is what people think about, but it really does involve things like agriculture, um, you know, manufacturing. If you read um, Project Drawdown, 100 Solutions for Climate Change, it literally is, you have to pursue all 100 solutions to climate change if we're going to succeed, or most of them at least, and be successful at them. So it's a huge undertaking that we have before us to change really all the ways we do everything, all of our systems. Okay, uh, Ellen Corley's got her hand up. So unmute Ellen and ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a theory that or what frustrates me is that there's a, a kind of culture war lobby of denial, you know, climate change denial that is spending billions <laughs> um, influencing uh, a lot of, uh, seems like the red states uh, in particular, that this isn't even real. And uh, actually I have some of the smartest people, I'm, I'm kind of a conspiracy researcher myself and it surprises me when um, 
you know, someone seems right about everything, but, and then they say, and climate change is a big fake. Uh, so what should I say to those people? Um, what do you think about that, uh, that, that culture war narrative out there that, um, that seems to deny um, this? And it, it's kind of hard to remember that, um, I mean, I've studied it, I believe in it, but uh, if half of the world doesn't, uh, um, and business doesn't, I, it gets discouraging. And I, I like your supply side take on it, you know, and I, I guess, what do you think about legislation requiring that, you know, business do the right thing, you know, and stop misinforming us about climate change denial, and especially like the military, you know, um, that's one that, that uh, they used to claim to be kind of environmentally aware, Michael Clare, but I get the feeling that they're kind of more behind uh, denial and, you know, focusing on warring against uh, hippies and green people and Democrats <laughs> and liberals. That's my question. Wow. There's a lot in that question. That's, that's great. Um, so let's see, in terms of climate denial, um, well, fortunately, it's actually going down in the United States. So I think what's really driven that is just people seeing the giant forest fires, <laughs> the catastrophic flooding, the heat waves in the Northwest this year were, you know, in Seattle, it got up to 100 and something degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which never happens in Seattle. So I think a lot of it has really been people just seeing the reality of climate change and finally saying, oh, well, obviously this is real, but you know? I, um, yeah. Can I, I read that there's, those fires are caused by nanobots. <laughs> I, you know, well, and, there's uh, always going to be some people who uh, believe uh, some right. conspiracy, um, and it's pretty much impossible to reach true conspiracy theorists. Uh, I know you had mm -hmm. one on your um, program last. Um, it's it's very difficult to change the minds of a conspiracy theorist. Um, factual information never changes anyone's mind, by the way. So if you actually give people a bunch of statistics and they don't believe you, uh, they won't actually tend to work. What you have to do is kind of connect with them on a more personal level and talk about why you're afraid of climate change and how you're seeing it and why it's a big concern for you. And then sometimes that can kind of open the door because it's more personal and approachable rather than like telling people you're a denier or, you know, here's the facts. <laughs> so. Yeah. What do you, what about, you know, getting back into the UN climate change thing, you know, really yeah. getting the votes and, and signing those agreements or treaties or um yeah have, <clears throat> have you made progress yeah, I mean, in that? well that's not an area we directly work on but um you know what's happened is that countries have signed on to pledges they're not exactly following the pledges they signed on to including our country. um but we're not the only ones and also, the <laughs> pledges that were signed on to weren't really sufficient. They were signed on to the Paris Accords several years ago, actually weren't really sufficient in the first place. So what we really need is for governments to step it up and uh, make really bold climate commitments and do it in a way that they're showing folks in their countries that this actually makes economic sense. So for the United States, if, if we're actually a, a leader in things like clean energy technologies, regenerative agriculture, climate finance, you know, all these different areas, it's actually going to help our economy in the next 50 years because we are going to be the leaders in the world. That's something that the entire world is going to need. And it's going to create more jobs for people in the United States. It's going to preserve our position in the world as a country. It's actually in our interest to do this. It's not just about the climate. It's actually also got a strong environmental argument to it. And if we're taking action to mitigate our climate emissions and address the impacts that are going to happen, and we're doing it now, it's also going to protect our economy. Because no matter what we do, we're going to see more floods. We're going to see more heat waves. You know, it's, it's inevitable at this point. But if we actually prepare for that in a way, um, we can actually mitigate some of the worst impacts of it and that will help our economy as well. So it's really more in a lot of ways uh, an economic argument at this point. And you, I think that's what Joe Biden's trying to do actually. <laughs> he does yeah. say it, but, but you know. But do you think, I, my, I used to work in insurance and mm -hmm. energy companies 
And yeah. what if they what if they did not insure Florida? <laughs> you know, for I mean, oh, all right, or you're right. a risk management, you know, kind of wow. penalized. Uh, I mean, forced companies, or we won't insure you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, if you don't. <clears throat> The insurance industry is actually one of the leaders, uh, particularly um, the reinsurance companies out of Europe actually have been leaders in actually understanding how bad this is going to be and the risks to them mm. as corporate corporations. So they actually are doing some of the things that you're talking about and actually penalizing for not uh, taking climate change into account already, some of them. But, and that's probably going to happen more um, so they're actually looking at that. Um, we do still have the problem of the fossil fuel industry, which tries to say all the right things, but then at the same time, keep telling us that there's no way we can get off of fossil fuels for the next 60 years. What, um, and what do you think about uh, nuclear? This we, we have a lot of pro-nuclear people yeah. here. Um, yeah. Do you think that's an alternative? A yeah. good alternative? Five, I'm just asking, five, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah you, you, you can have my opinion, and then I know you'll probably have a lively discussion of nuclear, so that's cool too. Um, uh, basically, at Green America, the concerns we have around nuclear power are these. So we have our current fleet of nuclear power plants that you're probably familiar with. It's about 20% of American power. They're all over the country. Those power plants are reaching the end of their lifespan and have significant safety issues. They're also really expensive to run. So they're going to get shut down no matter what anyone thinks of nuclear power, those plants are gonna increasingly get taken offline because they're too expensive to run and it's too expensive to upgrade them, to make them safe, to run past their 50 year lifespans. Um, so we know that's going to happen. There were efforts to build some new nuclear power plants at large scale. So these are big nuclear power plants. Those have largely failed in the United States. Uh, Southern Company is building a couple of them the Vogel reactors, um, and they were supposed to cost $13 billion. I think they now cost $28 billion. They're not done. Um, and then another company, Santee Cooper, was going to build nu nuclear power plants in the United States in the last decade. They spent $13 billion, I believe, and they never finished the plant. So it's an unbuilt $13 billion plant um, that the ratepayers are going to have to pay for now, even though they don't get well, any power out of it. So we just gave $700 million to Exxon yeah, right. for uh, nuclear we're gonna have, All right, Ellen, That's we're going to have to move mm -hmm. on now, all right? Margaret, you we, don't think nuclear, we don't think nuclear is part of the climate solution just because it's too expensive. You can't scale it up, and we just need to scale up clean energy now. Renewables. That's our okay. question. I, I think you're absolutely a, nuts, but Margaret, go I ahead. I just have a real simple question. I Good. am in an old high rise <laughs> in Dallas on Turtle Creek, along with several others, very venerable old buildings, which have what we call the two pipe system. It's basically uh, not refrigerated air. It's a water cooled system. You know, if, you, if you're in the north, you see radiators. Well, this looks mm -hmm. a little like radiators. Uh, what? Good. Harrison, people, of course, uh, I mean, I have, a, I'm very comfortable. I keep dehumidifiers running. My temperature is generally 68. You know, I like to keep it cool. Must admit, what is the difference between these water cooled systems and the modern refrigerated air that allows a four pipe system where you can change it over at your will from one moment to the next? Is the water chilled less environmentally damaging or are they about equal? Hmm. That's not something I'm terribly familiar with. So I actually don't know the answer to your question. Um, we really work more on these refrigerant systems that you know, use HFC refrigerants um, because of their damaging impact. I don't really know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah. And you know, years ago, you would have seen them out in the western part of the country mm -hmm. on farms. They would have coolers. <clears throat> My guess is that they are not as environmentally damaging, but I was just curious. Probably not. Um, yeah, there are those systems where you're basically putting pipes down into the earth and um, you know, you're actually drying on the cooling temperatures uh, underground. And, and those actually are really efficient. I mean, okay. if that's the kind of system you're operating on, those, those are highly efficient that's, that's and they're really not. They best. Water. You know, they either heat it or they chill it. Yeah. You know, and they're very, very, I must say, good about switching it. 
back and forth just as needed. Very, uh, but, and of course, in the last analysis, I'll make one comment. A lot of it could, a lot of this problem could be resolved if we all weren't so greedy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think uh, part of uh, our culture is to encourage us to always want to have more things. So it's not entirely the faults of uh, folks as individuals in the United oh. States. We, we live in a culture that tells us the only way you'll be happy is to buy more yeah. stuff. <laughs> So. Okay, uh, who's next with the next question? I can't, I have a question. Go ahead, Gian. Um, what, what do you think um, the ways that um, we can encourage people to drive more um, fuel efficient cars? I, um, I heard, the first time I heard the saying that uh, we should raise the gas uh, price and put the gas price some 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 percentage to um, help with the green um, effort, um, but I don't know it, it's uh, going to happen. Uh, of course, in the beginning, I thought, well, that would put pressure on um, consumers, but then I thought, well. If you put um, kind of surtax ta tax on fuel charge and make it a little bit more expensive, people would probably be more mindful of choosing cars that's more um, fuel efficient. Yeah, uh, well, certainly in Europe, uh, as you probably know, gas, or as they like to call it, petrol, uh, costs uh, far more than in the United States. Um, and as a result, their cars tend to be more fuel efficient than in the United States, and people tend to drive smaller cars. Uh, the one downside to raising the price of fuel um, is that it's a regressive tax in a sense, so that you know poor people would have to pay more money just to get to work. And, and a lot of Americans are already struggling, obviously, um, so uh, that is the problem with it. So folks who then want to you know, raise the price of using fossil fuels, the solution to that is to then rebate to lower income people money so that they actually have more money in their pocket to help them. Those rebates would only go to lower income folks, not to folks who are middle class, upper middle class and above. But that way you're helping to mitigate the fact that those people have to pay more, a, percent, a larger percentage of their income for things, necessities like gasoline just to get to work. And if you tax that higher, you're hurting them more. So you wanna like offset that in a way. So that, that's kind of how that system would actually work. And it, it, it probably would get Americans to buy more fuel efficient cars uh, when gas prices have historically gone up interest temporarily goes up in fuel efficient cars. <laughs> uh, and American cars actually are getting more fuel efficient. The problem is that then people buy SUVs because those SUVs are also more fuel efficient. Um, and Americans do like their SUVs and we've been marketed these SUVs at us for so many years. They're the number one car we actually buy now, unfortunately. So, um, so it's a little complicated, I think. Really, in some ways, the best solution is going to be to leapfrog to electric vehicles, because as those become less expensive and more attractive and they're more charging stations, people will like them because there's low maintenance on them. Um, they're, they work really well. They're really they're nice and quiet. I mean, there's like all these advantages to them. There's just some hurdles that remain. But once those are worked out, probably people will move to electric vehicles uh. in the next 20 years. Okay, let's move on. Uh, gentleman who says iPhone, I didn't catch your name, sir. So please unmute and uh, ask your question. Uh, Luke Matthews. You from the Dallas campus, Luke? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, here with, uh, I'm here with Ellen. Oh, okay, okay, good. Yeah, Luke, um, Luke Matthews. So uh, I've got a simple question. Uh, I wanna thank you, first of all, uh, Todd, for a, a very uh, uh, polished professional presentation and I want to congratulate you on the great work you and your organization are doing. Uh, it's outstanding. My question is uh, around China. Um, I think all uh, experts agree that China will be the largest economy in the world here. Uh, it's currently the second largest economy 
Um, compared to the United States, uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, China's environmental policy is years and years and years behind us. Uh, and uh, I'm just wondering if, 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 if that is correct. That's what I understand. And uh, what that uh, uh, what that impact will be. Mm. Um, yeah, China is a complicated case because I hear what you're saying about them in some ways being even behind the United States in their environmental policy. So you see the tremendous air pollution, for example, in Chinese cities, and that's the result of uh, they're burning coal. And the kind of coal that they burn is the worst kind of coal you possibly can burn in terms of air quality. Um, and uh, but at the same time, what's interesting about China is their pace of innovation as a country. And if you look at their trajectory over the last 40 years, going from one of the poorest countries in the world per capita to developing a middle class of hundreds of millions of people in a 40 year span of period of time is fairly incredible. <laughs> um, so their it's ability to innovate is pretty right? strong. Yeah, uh, they, and they actually are leaders in solar energy manufacturing, as you probably know, most solar panels are actually made in China. Um, they have a plan to get to electric vehicles pretty fast in China. Um, so they have the capacity to actually move quickly. Um, and for all the flaws of the Chinese Communist Party, of which there are so many, uh, their central planning enables them to move things in a really fast direction if they choose to do so and they can mandate it. So um, that's part of how they've grown so fast so far, uh, so quickly. And, uh, but on the other hand, obviously China has horrible problems uh, with its political system and repression. So it's- <laughs> in, terms of, uh, in terms of, putting the junk in the air compared to the United States, uh, where, where, how does that measure up? I mean, my, my, my thought is that the United States is doing a pretty good job compared to other countries in terms of uh, uh, emissions and et cetera. May, it, it, would that be a, a, a true statement or no? Not really. Um, we're not one of the leaders in the world, actually, in terms of cutting our emissions. We made strides, and those are all really important, what we have done, but we're not actually a leader there. Um, and China and, and the U.S. are pretty much neck and neck in terms of emissions. Of course, our emissions are for 330 million people. China's emissions are for about 1 billion people. Yeah, yeah. So, good on, a point, good point. so on a per capita basis, their emissions yeah. are lower than ours, considerably, Very good actually. Point. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, thank you. You're doing great work. I, uh, I, I really, and I like your uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Ted. All right. Well, okay. thank you. Thanks. All right, Jean, you've already had a question, but if nobody yeah. else has well, one, I, I, have I have a question. Really, I have a question. Charlie is my, next. My, my, my hand up here, Jim, Tim. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Yeah, you did. You did. All right, okay. then we'll go uh, Bob Adder, and we'll go Charlie. Uh, and then we'll uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, Todd. Uh, Twenty years ago, when I when I read uh, the book *Asphalt Nation* by uh, Jane Holtz K, the uh, figure she gave about pollution for automobiles was that um, that half of the pollution from an automobile, half of its lifetime pollution, is in its manufacture and disposal. Now that was in the days of gasoline cars. Now that we're, you know, emerging into the area of electric cars, um, are they are they more of a problem when it comes to disposal than of a, a gasoline car? You know, like gasoline cars, though, also have a lot of things like uh, 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 radiator fluid and transmission fluid and oil in them and things like that that electric cars don't. But of course, electric cars have the have the batteries, so what, what is what, what is it still the same figure? Do you think, or is it different now? As far as fifty percent of the pollution being from the manufacturer and and uh, and uh, you know junking of the car. 
Well, there still is uh, considerable carbon embedded in any manufactured good. So uh, unless you're running your uh, manufacturing facility and you're mining off of renewable energy, which you probably aren't, um, you know, there is embedded carbon in the creation of any vehicle, whether it's electric or gas powered. Um, with electric vehicles, obviously the emissions can be much lower over the life of the car, particularly if your electricity that you're powering the car from comes from renewable sources which it increasingly can. Um, and even if it doesn't, it's still better in terms of its overall emissions profile. And then at the end of life, um, what, what can be done with electric vehicles, uh, obviously you can do a fair amount of recycling of any vehicle into, it, into steel that can be recycled and other products from the car that actually can be recycled. The batteries, the lithium batteries themselves, it is possible to recycle lithium and, and turn that into new batteries. Um, it's fairly expensive to do so, but the costs are coming down. So I think that's going to be a possibility to improve the reuse of lithium and lithium batteries. Um, there's also new battery technologies that are being looked into um, that are less environmentally harmful than lithium. And so I think we might see those come down the line in the next 10 years as well. So hopefully there'll be a continued improvement in that area. Um, there is problems with lithium mining around the world. Um, this is one of the issues with renewable energy where no form of energy or technology is perfect and there's problems in the supply chains of everything. Uh, there are problems in the supply chains of rare earth minerals that go into windmills, wind turbines, up. solar energy, all that stuff. We have to fix all of that as well. And that's it. That's brought up the, the lithium mining. Uh, mm -hmm. that, and that's something I don't, I don't really know anything about is, is that mining just as horrible as mining for uh, others like copper and uh, you know stuff like in Minnesota or uh, you know yeah in Montana and Minnesota and all those places you know the you know mining for ore and everything it, uh, yeah are, uh, um, mine, mining uh, for almost anything is a fairly destructive practice um, it also depends on how the company carries it out so they're they're better and worse mines around the country for a variety of rare earth minerals. Uh, there's also labor conditions to take into account and whether you know it's actually fairly paid labor or is it operating off slave labor, which any well, of that, Well, that's do. economics. That's not environment. Oh, it's, a, it's a combination of all these things though that you look at. And that's why it's important for us to try and figure out ways to do reuse of these rare earth minerals uh, and not just need to rely on mining, especially as we're trying to scale up all these solutions. It is a really important area. Yeah, don't forget, you with the rare earth mining, you got a waste product called thorium, which is classified as a nuclear waste in the United States. Mm -hmm. That can be true as well. So, yeah, there, there are no perfect solutions to create perfectly green consumption is the bottom line. And honestly, in the United States, we shouldn't be looking at replacing every gas powered car with an electric car. That's actually not a really good solution to transportation. We should be in denser areas. We should be trying to make it more possible for people to use public transportation, biking, walking, things like that, and try and get off of cars as much as they possibly can. Obviously this doesn't work in a rural environment. You kind of need a car, but we shouldn't be trying to replace the hundreds of millions of cars in the United States that run on gas with electric. It's not really the right way to go. Well, all right. Um, now, I think Charlie had the next question, so go ahead, Charlie. Yes, Todd. According to what I, I'm having a little difficulty trying to figure this out. Your organization says that Developed countries, the people in developed countries should reduce their uh, pollution from 90%. And then you turn around and you say that underdeveloped countries can increase their pollution by 300%. Now, anybody that has the basic understanding of mathematics would say, that means we're right back where we're at. And there's no I see change. what you're saying. Well, that actually doesn't come from the uh, Green America. That comes from the UN, uh, that slide that I shared. Um, what, what you have to factor in is that's a per person uh, basis. 
So as individuals in rich nations, our carbon footprints are so enormous that we need to reduce them by 90%, which doesn't mean we have to completely give up everything we have in life. It just means we have to do things a lot more efficiently in a lot of cases and better. Um, but that, but for the folks who are poor, what they're talking about, the poorest people on earth have almost no carbon footprints whatsoever. Their carbon footprint is so negligible. And that's because they don't really even have access to electricity, running water. They have access to none of the things that we take for granted. There's gonna be some carbon footprint incorporated, even if you try to do that in a green way, you're gonna have some carbon footprint in bringing those necessary services to people so that they can have a good life. And even if their carbon footprint grows by 300% to do that, that's still far less than our carbon footprint as people in wealthy nations. So it's not like a one-to-one -one so correlation. I'm supposed to wash my rare old clothes and eat only vegetables, but some other people can do whatever they want? Well, it's not so much that they can do whatever they want. What we're talking about are people who are barely surviving <laughs> because they are living on less than a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we want is for everybody to have a decent standard of living in the world so that they have adequate food, adequate access to electricity, <clears throat> running water, education, all the things we take for granted, the necessaries of life. Um, so it's not so much they get to do whatever they want per se, it's more really just bringing them to a place where they have the things that we take for granted in the United States entirely, or many of us do at least. Of course, there are people in the United States who don't have the necessaries. They're, they're included in that figure of poor people who have very low carbon footprints because there are people in this country who don't have those things either. Okay, Gian, you're next. Can I ask a question? All right, quick question. What is your position? Right, Dan, Dan, Gian was oh. next, and then we'll go to you, okay? She's Gian, already had a question. I didn't have one yet. She's had a question. Can I have my first question go first? Ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Dan, Dan. Thank you. Uh, what is your position with Green America? Are you vice president of communications or something? Oh, I'm the executive co-director for consumer and corporate engagement. So Green America has two executive co-directors. The other yeah. one uh, works on our business areas. So working with companies. Um, is that a pay I work with consumers. Hmm? They're paid, pay yeah. position? Yes, we okay. have uh, 35 staff and we are all paid. Okay. So. Um, wondering about water. Do you work on water uh, like Nestle and Pepsi, Coke? taking water mm -hmm. out of Lake, Lake Michigan. Uh, where are you from? Texas? Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, I live in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, but I do know the problem you're speaking of. But it's not an issue that we actually work on, but other environmental groups are very active on those topics. Okay, do you, yeah, take, do you take money from Coke, uh, from uh, Tyson Foods, from uh, uh, Bechtel? Are you taking corporate money? Um, okay, so now with corporations, we don't take any corporate money from the corporations you mentioned. We do have these supply chain working groups I mentioned, and we charge corporations a fee to be a part of those supply chain working groups. So we do have some in agriculture, for example. So we have companies nice. like Danone pays, Cargill pays to be part of the network and food. Uh, um, there's a few other big companies. Archer Daniels Midland. No, they actually aren't part of the network <laughs> on regenerative agriculture. Cargill is a huge corporation. Mm -hmm. They are. They are. They are quite yeah. enormous. Yeah. Uh, so the reason we work with them is because they are so large and they have such a deep impact on food, both in the United States and around the world. That if we can get a company like Cargill to move in a more regenerative direction in terms of building soil and uh, addressing okay. climate change through healthy soil it'll have a huge impact. So we do how work much, with large corporations for that. How reason. much money does Cargill give you every year? I actually don't know offhand. Um, what is your budget? What is the Greening America budget for a year? Hmm. Six million? That's, that's million? easier. What? No, our budget is about $4 million a year. $4 million? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, most of that actually comes from individual 
donors, probably 70% of it is actually from individuals who donate money to us. We get money from foundations. We have a business network of small businesses that we certify as being truly green and they pay dues. And then there's those uh, supply chain working groups. The large corporations that take part in those pay fees to be part of the working groups to figure out how to green their supply chains. Is Walmart, is Walmart a member of your group? No. Nope. No, they don't take part in our supply chain. Amazon? Group. What about Amazon? No, I don't <laughs> think they would since we keep targeting them with campaigns. <laughs> so probably but no. They're masochistic or something. No. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, we, we do work with um, the electronic sector as well to get toxic chemicals out of that sector. So Apple, Dell, Intel and a few other companies belong to that, yeah. and they do pay fees. What about like Dow Chemical, uh, big mm -hmm. chemical companies? No? No, none of the chemical companies themselves take part. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sure. Okay, GN, go ahead. Okay. So I have a question and a comment. Uh, my question is about electric cars. So uh, we promote electric cars, um, I was wondering how, what kind of fuel that we use to produce electricity. How much mm -hmm. do we really save um, energy by using electricity? It has to be generated by some kind of energy. So that's the first question. And my comment was about uh, the um, the pollution, the green initiative in, in China. It, it, you really have to look at the time period. In the 80s and 90s, China had a lot of uh, uh, emissions um, of pollution, but in the last 10 years, China has reduced emission and uh, uh, its effort of um, like a, a new car emission, I think it's stricter than that mm -hmm. United States. So the new cars in, in China actually become more fuel efficient than United States. So there's, uh, uh, there's some um, quarters of discussion that if we want to have a competition with China, we should compete with, with who is doing more for the um, uh, environment in, in the years to come. Um, that will be a more healthy competition in terms of developing green technology and who can developing green technology, use green technology and reduce the uh, carbon fo uh, footprint uh, from, from now on. So that's the comment, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on the electric car question, with the current mix that most Americans experience, it varies across the country how your energy is produced, your electricity, of course. But there's been a dramatic decline in coal in the United States. So it used to be between 60 and 80 percent of the electricity when you turned on your light switch used to come from coal in the United States, no matter where you lived. That's gone down to more like 40 percent on average uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, 15 years. Um, and so if you actually run an electric vehicle now, overall, the emissions from that vehicle, even factoring in where the electricity comes from, are going to be lower than burning gas in a gas fuel vehicle, even at this point. The energy mix in the United States is going to become cleaner over the next 10 years. So that's going to get better and better. Also, if you deliberately purchase green energy for your home, you can ensure that it's coming from wind and solar and then you definitely are doing much better run an electric vehicle. So that's the current situation right now. And I totally agree with you on, on China. Uh, their government can take really assertive action and move things really fast in their country, and they have. And, and yeah, with the uh, vehicles, they've completely changed their vehicle infrastructure in a very short period of time. <laughs> and they have a mandate for electric vehicles that's in place. Uh, and they're going to reach it, I'm sure. And that's why Joe Biden wants to do the same thing in the United States. It's partly because it's good for the environment. It's also partly true. He wants the United States to still be competitive in vehicle production uh, in, in the world. What, what, Charlie? I got a question. Go ahead. 
You dead? Are you done, Todd? Yeah, that, that's good. I, I was just very, I was I, just agreeing with John. Let me ask you this. Isn't it a real problem with the automobile? Not how we get energy for, to run them, but something called roads and congestion. And we're mm -hmm. in a parking space that is, that is concrete instead of trees and grass and plants and little animals and birds living in trees. And also, isn't it better to have energy uh, where you can monitor how it's produced instead of like in a car, wherever you're producing your own energy in each vehicle? Isn't the infrastructure needed for cars uh, versus other transit modes? infinitely i mean a one l system carries over half a million people you want to put them all in the cars to go to work in chicago come on hey, no i totally agree with you and as i was saying earlier the uh, solution to our transportation issues in the united states shouldn't involve just replacing all the gas cars with electric cars in the United States, because that's not really a solution. We should be reformulating our entire infrastructure in the United States. Uh, actually, you know, some of the stuff that's in the infrastructure bill and if the reconciliation bill that's under consideration go through, there would be billions of dollars to try and increase things like mass transit, bike transit, um, and, and other ways of getting around that have a much lower carbon footprint, preserve green space, all the things you just mentioned. So I think there's opportunity there um, to move us off of uh, being car culture so much in the United States. And it would be better for our health personally, as well as for the planet if we did so. So uh, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Okay, uh, who's next on the questions? Um, Ellen, you got another question? Okay, um, I have one for you, Todd. Sure. You know, I just posted an article up. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I hear all this pipe dream stuff about, you know, renewables and how we got to do this and do that and do this. What is your basis of like a market-based solution for it? I've heard arguments that that's what's really going to stop global warming. Um, yeah, well, the market solution for renewable energy is really that the cost of wind and solar have fallen so dramatically that utilities on cost alone at this point are building the wind and solar instead of the gas-fired power plants that they were thinking of building. Um, so that's huge uh, in the United States, and we hadn't had that up until the last couple of years. So I think that's, that's a huge driver for moving to a renewable energy economy. Storage technology is coming down rapidly in price. So what happened with solar and wind is they both were too expensive 20 years ago. Everyone said, no one's going to build this stuff. And then as the technology improved and as it got implemented, the next generation happened, the cost came way down. The same thing's happening with storage technologies. And the one that everyone's familiar with is, of course, battery storage. So when you pair renewables with battery storage, you solve the problem of how do you keep the lights on? <laughs> which is what everyone always talks about with renewable yeah, well. energy. <laughs> um, and so it, I think, it, you know, there's research out there. There's some really good research from Stanford University, for example. There's been a number of studies that show the United States could move to 100% renewable energy in 10 years and meet all of our energy needs. It's totally possible to do it. Based on the technology we have now, it's totally possible. And the technology keeps improving. So it is actually possible to do it. It's just a matter of politics, really. If, if we want to do it, we can do it. Um, I know when they shut down all the nuclear in Germany and tried to go back to their, to their power, the cost of electricity has basically skyrocketed in Germany. They've tried it and they're not finding much success with it when they went to solar and wind power. And they're now having a lot of trouble keeping their lights on in the area. And they've actually using a lot more coal than they ever did. That's because they shut down their nuclear power plants all at once. They literally just stopped using them in one day. <laughs> and that's not how you get rid of uh, something, a technology. Like it's not what we did with coal. It's not like we just stopped using all the coal-fired power plants in the United States on Tuesday. 
um, we just didn't build more and then we started decommissioning them and then we replaced that with cleaner sources of energy as the coal plants get decommissioned. The same thing would happen around nuclear energy as well over the next 20 to 30 years. It's not like all those plants are going to shut down that currently And uh, I like, you know, the thing is every time you have a gas plant, a, a, a wind or a solar plant, you got to back it up with a natural gas plant to, uh, and in a lot of cases, you have to back it up with natural gas to keep the lights on when the wind blows, go when the sun don't shine. Oh, and I mean, I know on, that, that stupid Trumpism. Uh, Charlie, that's I don't stupid. think so. I really don't that's think so. I'll stupid get into it. Trumpism. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I think you're right that you know uh, sometimes the sun doesn't shine, sometimes the wind doesn't blow. So that's where the storage technology is coming in and you're seeing these giant storage plants uh, like there's one in australia that's just incredibly huge largest one in the world um that's the future of how you actually keep the lights on um is to feed renewable energy into battery and other storage technologies and then release the energy as you need it so the battery technology is improving where it could only hold that energy for a certain period of time the amount of time you can actually store the energy is growing. So that way you actually can keep the lights on and you don't need to build the gas speaker plants that uh, we've built in the last 20 years. All right. I, I'm just going to ask you this. Do you have any idea of how the power grid works? <laughs> or do you have any idea at what it's going to take to really change our grid in the United States to go to the smart grid stuff? That's yeah, it's going to cost a question. No, it's, it's going to cost trillions of dollars is, is the answer to your question. And we right. need to spend trillions of dollars on the grid, no matter how we put energy onto it, because the current grid that we're using is unsafe. Uh, it's open to hacking. Um, it's not meeting our needs as a country. It, it, we're going to have to upgrade the grid no matter what. We might as well upgrade it in a way that uses renewable energy and storage technologies. <laughs> so. But are you familiar with grid reticence? Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with what they did in, in some places in Canada where they once once they got above 30 percent renewables that they had to do a lot more backup power than they were to create the grids? I, I'll, I'll Todd, I'll get into it a little later on. I just sure. don't see that sure. renewables are going to cut it. I, I just don't. Hmm. And the only real anyway, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll get into it later. I don't mean to do it. You did do a good presentation tonight, and I really appreciate at least you coming out and I'm applauding your efforts, you know, getting some of these corporations, especially with the Is this a question? Okay. I'm done, Charlie. I've, Go got ahead, a question. I've got a question. Go ahead, Ellen. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the, uh, well, let me see. Um, I guess it'd be interesting. One thing is, you know, if there is a study of, um, like best practices and countries, like you said, um, you know, where grid technologies and renewables work, that would be interesting. You, you may have already done it, um, but the, uh, I know we used to say micro turbines that they could store things locally um, inside with nitrogen or, um, but it, it, it is, I I'd asked, wanted to ask before about this 700 million, um, Illinois has just given to Exelon for their nuclear and um, I, you know, this kind of decision making and, but they promote it as jobs, you know, and renewable. <laughs> um, but, and uh, so regarding nuclear one, I, it, it just, I don't know how we can stop, uh, you know, the, the effect of lobbyists and, you know, each state separate by separate, um, uh, you know, loopholes and um, budgets and, you know, government uh, spending. And specifically, one of my concerns I've heard regarding nuclear is that they use the uranium for the bomb. So I think they're going to take the 700 million and use it for creating more um, nuclear bombs. Um, have you heard, done any research on that? You know, it might be a, we could effectively shut those things down and put the money toward real renewables, I think would be interested in that kind of research. 
Mm. Well, the uranium that's used in the United States and the nuclear reactors that are used for civilian purposes in the United States, uh, to my knowledge, do not feed into military uses in the United States. That's not a concern in this country. However, uh, in other countries where they've developed civilian nuclear technology, they have used that as a stepping stone to developing weaponized uses. Um, so it is part of the proliferation problem around the world. Um, but we don't do that you, here in the United States. We actually use specific reactors to produce nuclear weapons. Let him in the United States. The question. No, it's okay. That's fine. I just wanted to make that point that that's that's not that that in the United States that's not so much the concern with the nuclear waste. It's more of the storage of it over the long term. We don't have a solution for storing spent uranium in the United States that's long term. It's all stored on site right now in right. casts uh, and. Uh, you know, it actually poses risks to the communities in which it's stored. We tried to create long-term storage technology and putting it underground in Utah. Uh, nobody actually wanted it who lives there, understandably. Um, so there aren't too many countries that have actually figured this problem out of how to store spent nuclear waste. I think the closest is Finland. They actually have something that they're building that they hope will safely store it. But even they don't know if their solution is really going to work. And some of that waste will remain radioactive for several hundred thousand years. And so it's hard right. to say if it will really work that long. To, to follow up on that question, though, was that, like, I read that in Palo, Pennsylvania, the Mossad um, Rafiatan got a whole lot of uranium and stole it, you know. Um, and so, you know, I think if we were it wouldn't you wouldn't know it unless you really researched it and exposed <clears> it. a group like you if you could I don't somehow break past the the idea that this is classified because it's not actually legal to classify treason <laughs> right and uh, cover up you know um so you know getting into that military black budget I, I think would be an important way to deal with environment and anti-war machine. You want them to look into your conspiracy theory? It's the, so there's a lot of conspiracy theories on conspiracy theory. and Yeah, we need to investigate them. We need we have a right to an honest investigation. Every conspiracy theory is a theory. Every every investigation is a an, a hypothesis. Well, you verified yourself. And, um, I, I think if we checked them out, there could be some real impact. Looking at corruption, government corruption, as a way to right, I got a question, force Jeff. them to change. All right, Charlie, go ahead. There was one figure there, so I'm often told that socialized economies are hopelessly inefficient, and free market capitalist economies work. They work so well. And I was disturbed to see you give a figure that 170 million children are employed worldwide making clothing. Is that an accurate figure, sir? That's just- a uh, No, no, it's 170 million children are engaged in work around the world. So they're actually working instead oh, okay. of going to school. A number of those are in the textile sector, but they're in other sectors as well, agricultural sectors around the world, yeah. including things like cocoa and sugar and all the other products that we buy. Um, I, there's, there's a wide range of things where there's child labor around the world. Uh, it's a huge problem, um, but it's not just clothing. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Does Green America recommend uh, companies, mutual funds that uh, uh, have high scores for being environmentally uh, friendly and socially responsible? Is that information available on your website to in, for investors? Yeah, we have a whole section of our website dedicated to socially responsible investing. Um, there are a number of uh, mutual funds included there that do exactly what you say. So they're screening out companies that are, it depends on what screens you want, but they're screening out companies that are involved in the fossil fuel sector, for example, or weapons or uh, testing on animals. There's a wide range of issues where they're active. Um, and then those companies also take the stock that they hold in companies, so they screen out the worst, 
try to hold better companies. And then they use the stocks that they hold in those companies to try and push the companies to improve more. So that's how socially responsible funds work. So do you have a like, particular criterion um, to screen these and when, when they show up on your uh, screen, you have like particular criteria and scores to, uh, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, we, we partnered with a company um, that uh, looks at mutual funds and gives them ratings based on um, how strong their performance is on social environmental factors. And so that, that is available on our website as well. Uh, we can try and find the link while we're here. <laughs> yeah, if you can uh, put the link on our uh, chat. chat. Uh, sure, yeah, I'll look for that as we're chatting. <laughs> and I think they, they are worth um, supporting and they have good records and they might mm -hmm. also do financially well because they have um, stay in power to uh, promote environment friendly and also do well for investors in the long run. Yeah, definitely. There's a strong academic evidence that socially responsible funds uh, perform just as well as non-socially responsible funds. There's no difference in performance to you as an investor. So there's no reason not to uh, invest your money in a responsible way because you not take a financial hit for doing so. So it's, it's, a, it's good all yeah. around. Yeah. On that note, um, I used to work for an ad agency that made a BP green and that, you know, it's telling Luke it's greenwashing, you know, and um, sure. maybe it'd be interesting if you could, you know, kind of expose the, you know, fraudulent Hippocratic greenwashing <laughs> versus uh, real environmental corporate responsibility. Which, which companies would you, like, which kind of gas should I buy? Is there any that's better than the other or um, is it worth it to use the pay the extra money for the, I don't know, are you in Chicago? You know, there's, um, you know, I could get the environmental one, the environmental package from ComEd, I think, something like that. Um, it, it's, you know, it'd be actually, my stepfather was actually listed on an enemy of the earth years ago. <laughs> it it kind of traumatized me, you know, but looking back on it, he probably was right, but I, you know, mainly because he was, you know, a neoliberal, you know, um, right? So are it, you it, really asking him what? Well, yeah, is I'm asking where are these indexes nice at the. What kind of gasoline should you buy? How about well, buying none at all? Is Exxon better than BP? I, they well, they put themselves all green, and kind of maybe they don't. That? Well, I think some of them maybe are less. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go to the Arctic ruin it you know than others you know uh yeah they, um, unfortunately there is no gasoline you can buy for your car that's really better than any other gasoline so that you know it's best to just try to reduce your gas usage as much as you can um but when you're buying energy yeah that does make a difference so if either your energy provider so if you're in a regulated monopoly state, I don't know if Illinois is, but if, if you have to buy it from your utility and they have a green option, it's good to choose the green option. If you're in an open market, which a number of states are, where you can buy your electricity from any provider you want that's on the marketplace, then you have a lot of options and you can look for one that's 100% solar and wind uh, and you can buy from them. Oh, right. It Here's another question. Do you think this COVID year, did we, um, did our, did we save Jim, energy this year? Jim, let's um, get control of the Because we community. spent less. I'm asking, I my I'm letting was Ellen smaller. finish her question, Charlie. No, it's getting into COVID. Charlie. Now get control of the media. No, I'm for, asking about energy um, use. Yeah, yeah, I'm rambling on. This is like our fourth, fifth question. Well, um, it's actually, it's actually a perfectly uh, fine question with me. Uh, when, when COVID first hit the world economy, Early, let him finish. We, we actually did reduce our energy consumption for that first year. But now that economies are recovering, it's actually shot back up. So it was very temporary. Um, and obviously, you don't want to have a situation where the only way you can reduce your energy consumption is through millions of people 
dying from a disease and, uh, <laughs> and, and being thrown out of work and being put into hardship, we want to plan for reducing our energy consumption. We don't want it to happen as a side effect of a horrible illness that's uh, spread across the world. So how much did it come down? What percent? Do you know? Um, I don't know the exact here? percentage, but it, it was it was appreciable. Like there, there was actually a drop in carbon emissions and energy consumption across the whole world, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot. I, I There was some stories and then National mm -hmm. Public Radio about this, too, about how a lot of the cities were actually getting a, clean, a lot cleaner air because the yeah. cars weren't going around and all that stuff for a while. And there was a lot more, uh, even China noticed, too, when they had the lockdown that their pollution mm -hmm. stopped a lot. But, you know, um, and stuff, there was an appreciable uh, cut in carbon emissions in 2020 because of the COVID uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And you can find it almost anywhere on the web. Bob, mm -hmm. anybody else have a question? Doug? Oh, right no, quick question. Regarding uh, the stock in companies that are predominantly oil, like Exxon, Mobil, and so on, are there any of those companies that are doing more, making more efforts to move to green energy? Generally speaking, no. Uh, companies that do fossil fuel um, drilling, um, they talk about the things that they're doing, but they're not really doing anything of any value at the moment. Um, so it, there's there's no real difference between Exxon Mobil, BP, Shell. It, it doesn't make too much of a difference which one you hold. There are some activist investors who deliberately hold Exxon, and they had some success last year in forcing some board members off. And huh. trying to get some board members on who actually would start addressing the climate impacts of the company. So if you actually do happen to own Exxon, Shell, or BP, you should use your shares in an activist fashion if you want to continue to hold your shares and, and vote for things like share owner proposals to get them to move in the right direction. Or you can divest your shares in, in those companies and invest in something that's greener. Your choice. Um, there was right. a... There's a story I'm looking on a national public radio that I'll put a link on. It's big oil probably is going away anytime soon, but it's changing. They are investing in, in renewable technology. They're betting on a transition to renewables and they are um, starting to uh, lower their carbon footprint, but they're doing things like carbon capture and going to natural gas. All right. Who else has a question? Yeah. He made a face. It looks like he doesn't think that's enough and that's my question is it is it enough you know um like i don't know how long you've been working but have you seen have you had an impact <laughs> and you know how can we have a significant impact uh, you know it's not easy hmm. yeah i mean i don't think it's worth putting a tremendous amount of energy into trying to get companies like exxon mobile to reform and be better companies uh, they do some things, they actually do have some investment in renewable energy, but they're just hedging their bets, essentially speaking. Uh, they do plan to keep drilling for the next three decades, however, at least. Um, and we can't afford that. So, you know, that's the problem with these companies. I think it makes a lot more sense for us to change the companies that use energy um, and try and get them to put pressure on the energy companies to change faster. Because big companies, have a lot of say. So like Apple is a $3 trillion company. So if Apple is pushing for renewable energy from all of its suppliers and is pushing the banks that they put their money with to move uh, to investing in renewable energy, well, they'll listen to Apple because they have $3 trillion. Um, so that's, that's where we put our energy is like, how can we get the big companies who are consumers themselves to use their leverage? Right. And are there any particular companies that you would like us to help you leverage? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. Should we focus on? <laughs> no, I mean, we do have campaigns on our website. Um, yeah, Janice, um, so I actually... just put a link in the oh, chat room. Uh, it's the green, greenamerica.org uh, slash finance. Oh. So if you click this link. Jeanne, we can hear you. Um, Jeanne, mute yours. I don't know. Um, can you hear me? Oh yes. yeah. We're, yeah, yeah. Can you? So I put a link. I already put a link for uh, greenamerica.org finance. If you click the link, you will see a list. Oh, okay. 
Is this his list, the one you're suggesting that we, mm -hmm. that have a big impact or, or um, these are good ones versus bad ones? I, I'm interested in the bad yeah. ones. <laughs> oh, okay, so um, the, the first link is a, a mutual funds you could look to invest in to see if, if you want to do screened investments. Uh, the mm -hmm. second link is actions you can take. So it's uh, different actions to different companies on worker rights, the environment, things like that. So you can take any of those actions to support our efforts to move those companies to be greener. Um, Sorry, is that about it for questions? I think so, Charlie. Well, I, I, I think I, you've had I enough questions. questions. Right. I think right. it's time we've had enough questions. All right, Charlie, we'll start rebuttals then. I got, I got a short question for probably both Charlie and Todd might be able to answer this one together. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was downtown this afternoon. I got on the Brown Line at uh, Madison and, uh, and Wabash, and well, I got on the platform. When I got up to the platform, uh, the, the screen said 14 minutes for the next train. Uh, you know, at what point, what is going to, pe people won't uh, take public transit with these kind of long headways, I don't think. I don't think we're ever going to pry people out of their cars when they know that they're going to have a 14-minute wait for a train. And many times I've waited 20, 25 minutes for a bus. Is there, a, is there some kind of uh, known study or chart of, you know, what headways have to be to actually pry people out of their cars. And I remember on the, at the old college complexes and when we met at the Lincoln restaurant, um, Don the Younger used to always say that, you know, it, it, he could still drive from Hyde Park to, to the Lincoln restaurant faster than he could get there via transit. Uh, so anyway- I can answer the question. Study on that? Number yeah. one, people don't care at all about headways. I do. They list. I'm telling you, what there's been studies have been done on this. Okay. But if, you, oh, if you know the why you ask a question if you know the answer. No, you I don't know the answer. I don't, I I don't know, know the answer. Fact that nobody cares about headways. What they care about are vehicles following the schedule. Now, if it doesn't follow the schedule. Now, a 14 minute wait is, is you telling me you can't wait 14 minutes uh, for a, a, a vehicle? Bob, I don't know what you do in life that it's that important. You have to be someplace. But now they have headways as short as five minutes. Now you're talking. So 14 minutes is not going to doesn't is not gonna and Eddie, come on now you're being absurd well no, no, I don't you, think you want instant transportation yes unless it's instant transportation it's no good that's the criteria you're posting I, I think you're wasting, that's why you like the most that's why i like the more wasting my well, that's time. the thing because once i get to the once i get to the once i get no, to you the, just the, don't want to use public transit i can tell baloney once, once I once I get to Damon, I may have to wait uh, another twenty minutes for a bus. So this really adds to you know every day you're going. public transit, depending on the mode, can in fact be faster. Anybody in New York knows that this subway is a hundred times faster than a car. Anybody knows that. Yeah, but that's New York City with a high density of people, where it makes sense. The thing is, Charlie, I like my car. Well, there's a guy who tells me that a car and a bus come, are on the, on the same the road, are but we, the car is faster. Are we faster. in the questions or what? Let's go, are we, let's go to, let's go let's to go the to other rebuttals. Thing. Who's moderating? Yeah. I'm supposed, yeah. Let's oh, he asked me a question. You talk 10 times and then I can't answer a question. I asked a question. You're <laughs> babbling. You're, you're taking, abusing your power as usual, Charlie. So <laughs> he asked me a question. Wait a minute. <laughs> Charlie, you're just part of the patriarchy. Oh, I know that. All <laughs> right, uh, let's go to rebuttals now. Who's got a rebuttal? All right, Bob, I know you got one. Who okay. else? Yeah. All right. Uh, Ellen and uh, Charlie. 
Doug, you got a rebuttal, I hope. You've been on, on board for a while. All right, we're going to start with uh, whoever wants to go first. We'll go maybe five minutes each. I'll keep a timer handy. And uh, who wants to speak first? I'd like to go first. I'll go All first. All right, Ellen, I'll give you five minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Todd. That was great. And uh, thank you for your work. It sounds like a wonderful model. I, I wish I could ask you more questions, maybe later. Uh, um, you know, uh, because, I, you know, like Jan and I are um, working on World Beyond War. And, um, you know, when you join an organization, or I also am involved with the Alliance Against Racist Political Oppression, trying to bring justice uh, for the criminal justice reform. And, you know, it can be discouraging. And I know you addressed that, but, uh, you know, um, it, uh, I see, you know, it's the supply side corruption and um, I, there does seem to be an abuse of power uh, by entrenched power uh, people, the FBI, the, you know, the power elites, the political ones, the, um, the, the Mossad, you know, or whatever they are, the Zionist power configuration that, uh, you know, they're invisible and, um, but I, you know, what can you do? I, but I appreciate, I think by addressing the corporations like you are um, and making them hear you, you know, uh, activists investing, that's, you know, my stepfather, friend of the earth, uh, you know, enemy of the earth was with Manhattan Institute, CIA front group, it turns out, uh, you know, um, Wall Street, same ones that financed Hitler, <laughs> you know, they, they didn't even know it, you know? And so we, uh, you know, it's very possible that there's, uh, there's no, um, there's a maliciousness, a malicious intent behind the powers that be and call that a conspiracy theory, but I think it's worth one we must uh, test <laughs> because it happens to have a huge influence. Um, I was a market researcher, I still am. And, you know, I think we have to survey. I, my latest idea is to do a Delphi method. This guy said to, you know, get, I'm looking at the COVID. It was made at four d trick. That's why I'm against the mandates. It's a form of biowarfare. They make the vaccine, they make the virus. Fauci made it, you know, um, Congress paid for it. Homeland Security paid for it and, uh, but, nobody's allowed to say it. National security has to, um, they're not allowed to tell the truth about crimes that America is waging around the world. And um, it would be treason, exactly like Edward Snowden and, um, you know, Julian Assange had found out, you know, they, they've exposed important stuff, 9-11 truth, COVID truth. But this is, uh, you know, nobody can verify it. And uh, because, Michael Hayden, I'm watching American Secret, can just sit there and lie to us. And um, I don't know, you know, we just have to keep them honest. And I, I keep looking for regulations, honest services laws, EPA, you know, they deregulated all this corruption and crime and uh, corporate treason, uh, you know, and just like, oh, it was deregulated and, you know, it's a state secret to not tell you anybody about it. And now the media, you know, with this COVID, I've been tried for a year and a half to say it was made at Fort Detrick, not Wuhan gave the little, the little bio warfare, a little AIDS genetic code that they encase and put over in Wuhan. But you know, if, if we would just say it and then they have to pay for it. Okay, it's called reparations. Give us, you know, all of what Gates has, all of what Buffett has, all of what the United States government and the Mossad and the CIA has and give us reparations. And so I, yeah, I do suggest that you look at these conspiracy theories and um, flesh them out because, it, you know, I used, when I worked at People's Energy, I, then I probably wouldn't have had the nerve to say anything. <laughs> you know, once if you're an insider, you're a, you know, you're a soldier, you're not allowed to, you know, yes, sir, you know, we'll uh, silence, code of silence, you know, here, you know, we're, we didn't kill, wrongfully convict one third of the people in prisons today. They're not allowed to say anything. So anyhow, that's my five minutes. Thank you. All right. Okay, who's next? 
All right. We just had uh, Ellen go and who's, who's has another rebuttal. All right. I'll go, Tim. All right, Bob, go ahead. I'll give you five minutes. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Uh, I think, uh, I think your uh, movement has some, uh, some positive uh, things going for it, but also a few, a few problems. But the thing I would do is I would not, I would not be dipping a toe into a field that you guys apparently know nothing about, like, like economics, uh, you know, like going for like, you know, these, 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 uh, concepts like worker justice and, and that kind of thing, you know, uh, people are responsible for their own uh, justice. If they don't like working somewhere, uh, they can leave. They can improve themselves and, and get a higher wage, you know, better working conditions some, somewhere else. And I, I wouldn't be, uh, you know, nosing into that stuff. Uh, and let's see, uh, Alan did mention something about, uh, uh, conspiracy theories and uh, and the FBI and I just happened to uh, hear a podcast today when they interviewed Glenn Greenwald and it turns out that the uh, uh, the person who was supplying the FBI with information about alleged you know this alleged Russian collusion with Trump uh, you know the, the FBI asked him if he was being paid by any you know political campaign or party to, to say this stuff and he denied it well it turns out he's a, he was actually on the on the payroll for, uh, for the campaign to re-elect hillary clinton and they you know the records are right there now it's, it's like undeniable this was all this was all bullshit this was a this whole russian thing was concocted by you know hillary's campaign fed to the fbi the fbi uh, agents investigated it came back to their superiors and said there's there's nothing here. This is all you know a crack of bullshit. But the superiors were also on Hillary's side, and they said no, keep keep investigating. And uh, so anyway, then we when we had what four or five years of that Russian Trump stuff going on every day, got got to the point. I said I was so sick of hearing it that I try I quit listening to NPR over it, which I guess was a benefit. Uh, now I wanted to mention here about uh, walkable communities. Everybody wants to live in a walkable community. However, uh, as you know, Henry George and Adam Smith before him pointed out, all benefits of society accrue to the landowners. So you could get rid of your car and maybe even not take public transit by living in a walkable uh, community. But what does that mean? It means you're going to be paying about, you know, two or three thousand dollars for rent, probably instead of uh, five hundred or eight hundred for rent. Uh, Which is so what it is in New York. Yeah, in New York, it's much higher. Uh, Thirty-three thousand four hundred is per month is not uh, not uncommon. But uh, you know, oh yeah, you don't have to own a car, but yeah, you got to you know you got to pay so much money. And then parking, you know, and all that. And it's you know it's crazy. So uh, that's one reason why we should look at having a a Georgia's uh, tax system, which is like you know taxing land in lieu of everything else. Um, something to look into. And then finally, I wanted to. Uh, mention a couple recent books out. Uh, one of them I'm reading right now, and the other one uh, uh, I'm not reading yet. I think I probably will. And that's Facing Reality by Charles Murray, the one of the co-authors of The Bell Curve from the, from the mid-90s, who took a lot of heat and punishment uh, for uh, exposing the IQ gap between, uh, between races. Uh, and now because of all the, you know, we're, we're hearing all this stuff, you know, systemic racism and all this, he decided to write another book and kind of, uh, I don't know, I think, I think a lot of it may be a rehash, but maybe an update of, of the bell curve that uh, what's happening here is that we don't really have systemic racism. What we have now is the, you know, the manifestation of the uh, IQ gap, not only the IQ gap, but also the, the criminal gap. Uh, between uh, between the races and uh, uh, you know there's overlap but there's also you know difference in means and uh, so it's like uh, you know the Asians have the highest IQs followed by whites then followed by blacks and so what we have here the reason we have uh, this inequity in wealth it's not because of systemic racism it's because of the IQ gap and you know and the uh, uh criminal gap when all these these people have you know lower iqs they're just 
not going to earn, you know, that it's very much related to what you earn. High IQ people go to uh, uh, the best schools, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, et cetera. And when they get out, they marry other people from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, Stanford. They have children that inherit those high IQs and they go to those good schools. And this keeps going on and on. They get the best, of course, these are all the senior positions at, at Google and uh, Facebook and Amazon and all those places, people making the high salaries. And this is what, what is the you know uh, root cause of the inequality in, in, in wealth, not, not systemic racism, but in fact, uh, IQ. The IQ gap and the you know criminal gap. So a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, blacks and Hispanics have you know criminal records, and I've noticed you know I said I've been a legal investigator for you know 13 years, and one thing I notice is that when I uh, you know track down like a hit and run driver, somebody that uh, does a, you know that does a hit and run, they usually are the type of people that have made other bad decisions in their life. And I, when I do the comprehensive research on them, I find out that they've got a couple bankruptcies, you know, they can't hold a job. They've got several mm -hmm. criminal offenses they're, you know, they're divorced, they're behind on their child support. So all these kind of problems all kind of go, uh, you know, like pork and beans, you know, and, and, and uh, so this is the problem those communities are facing. And that's why, we have this wealth gap. Now, the other book is Making Sense of Race by Ed Dutton. It basically covers all the material that uh, Facing Reality does by Charles Murray. It's just that he doesn't sugarcoat things and soft pedal like Murray does, probably because Murray was, you know, took so much heat back in the mid 90s when, when the bell curve came out. So I highly recommend uh, reading those two books. Okay, and that is it. All right, thanks, Bob. Who's next? Uh, Janice, you always got something to say in the same thing. Jeanne, you got something too, I hope. We still got time for rebuttals. Uh, Go ahead, Jeanne. I'd like to hear you. Five minutes. Thank you. I don't really have rebuttals, but I do appreciate Todd's pre presentation. And um, um, I think it's very important that everyone um, plays a role in uh, reducing uh, carbon footprint for printing. Um, I have like now I don't buy new clothes. I usually buy clothes in a secondhand store. It saves money and then recycle. Um, I uh, switched from my um, uh, Mini Cooper to Prius. Mini Cooper was like, when I was driving Mini Cooper, it, it was like 25 miles per gallon. And now with Prius, it's 60 um, miles per gallon. So it's a, a big, big change. Um, and um, those of you who have heard me presenting, um, I have a PhD in anthropology and I'm still interested in many topics and cultures. Um, from anthropological point of view, people are more or less same, like as in population, uh, big population wise. Of course, within a population, you have people who have different abilities. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, everyone's same, but it, 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 it probably, we have to acknowledge people have different abilities, but as a society, um, I'm for um, helping each other to achieve their greatest potential in general and those who need help. Um, it is the, uh, it's a good thing that we can uh, offer help uh, instead of blaming um, other people. So that's my just ge general um, comment. I, I, I'm trying to kind of stay in a positive uh, territory and do what I can for the environment, what I can to help uh, instead of um, kind of complaining because complaining doesn't really go too far for ourselves and for other people. And I appreciate Todd's effort in moving um, um, our, our society into a more green, uh, socially responsible manner. 
Okay, Janice, thanks. How about you, Charlie? You got something to say? Yeah, all right. First of all, let's thank our speaker, uh, Todd. That was a very nice presentation and an excellent overview of the ecological situation facing us all. And I have to applaud you and your organization for what you're doing. I, I'm really impressed by the multitude of areas that you've gotten into and the depth of your research. I will be eclectic as usual. Uh, regarding transportation, a subject to which I do have some degree of familiarity, you, anytime you talk about transportation, you talk transportation modes, M-O-D-E-S, and you compare them and each have the unique features, uh, pros and cons, depending on your perspective and ecological approach. Now, I reside personally in Chicago in a sustainable community. I can walk to a grocery store, a two pharmacies, uh, even a, uh, a Subway and a McDonald's and a Starbucks. I don't go to too often, but it, I never, now Bob says, for some reason, he says these are impossible, but says I know about the city of Chicago and I deal with this transportation wise, is that we've identified 85 communities. They're called neighborhoods and they're sustainable communities. And Bob Matters thinks, oh, these are some strange places, but they're all over the city, Bob. They're called neighborhoods and people live in them and they do not pay exorbitant rents in order to do so, nor do I. But anyhow, another thing regarding transportation, since I live so much centrally located, my transfer point for public transit is right where all the highways come together. The traffic circle in the center of the spaghetti bowl, they used to call it. And when I go there, I see all the people can get in the cars and travel instantly and then sit in congestion. Every single day of the week, all day long, there is nothing but cars backed up where these highways come together. Now, I've observed this while I'm on the metro train that speeds past it all, or on a CTA train uh, that speeds past them. And I watch all these cars, which allow you to get every place. So now the major topic in transportation, amazingly enough, Tim, is congestion. Chicago's about the worst city to always way up there in the top 10 for people just getting in vehicles, sitting there and burning petroleum products. That's because so they, we haven't upgraded yeah, our roads and bridges in quite turn, a while. Pal. My turn, pal. Um, <laughs> Now, recording, I heard this congest. I heard Weinberg worrying about corporations. Now, today, amazingly enough, I attended a, a powwow of the Illinois Green Party, and one guy was saying, We're not taking corporate money for campaigning. And he actually asked me, he said, Well, are there corporate unions? And I said, I have no, no idea, sir what you're talking about. There are corporate and non-corporate unions. This is getting absurd. I, I don't understand this. What in the world is a corporate union? Um, anyhow, but if you want to, now the one corporation, and this is where I'm gonna get serious. I, I, I get the, I subscribe to the bad guys to find out what they're up to. And the really bad corporation in answer to Margaret, if she's still out there, is ExxonMobil. They are running all sorts of social media stuff, which is anti-ecological uh, legislation. And I've even cop tried to copy their ads. It took some doing. I wasn't able to do it at first, but they run advertisements. Like if you don't, if you listen to these greenies, it will cost us jobs. And they have a picture of a woman, a black woman working in an oil refinery. 
Well, what kind of message are they trying to convey? If you go green, you will put that woman out of work. Clearly, and they run ads amazingly like this. I copy and paste them and redo the, the, the text and send them on to others in the green community. And they've been doing this for some time. So if you wanna talk about corporations. Now, the only other thing, I may have some misses in our academic discussion. I really have always maintained, now granted I'm a lobbyist, but government policy has got to be changed. And while we adopt all of these individual practices, this is really good, but I don't think they really have the effect that changing government-wide policy does instantaneously. You see, it doesn't require cooperation or everybody agreeing to do this or that. And it, it's that's where the, the money is, to my perspective. I certainly don't disavow leading a low consumption lifestyle. I do, I've been doing it for an awful long time, but I don't want to recommend or force it upon others, which uh, I don't know if that is even going to work. But thank you very much, Todd. Come back again and give us an update on what you guys are up to. Thank you. Now that uh, anybody else has a rebuttal right now. Uh, Tim, I forgot to sh show, show a graphic. When I, was I, I, just, I found this uh, found this online. I just thought it'd be worth taking a peek at. And uh, so this is uh, global temperatures from the past. And you can see where here's where we are right now. This little this little upturn right here. And look at where we've been in all these previous periods. So you see what we have here is a tempest in a teacup. Now. You know, I do worry a little bit about this rapid increase in uh, car in uh, carbon dioxide. So 15 years ago, I got rid of my car and started bicycling and uh, for the most part using public transit uh, without any government, without coercion or any government incentives, just just the incentive of uh, of uh, you know burning light. Well, I don't also didn't like the pollution, carbon monoxide either, very much against all the other crap that comes out of tailpipes, which and there's a lot of it. Uh, so I, I stopped uh, driving because of that. Uh, but anyway, and other people could do it. But like I said, I didn't uh, I didn't get paid extra for it, like uh, or get a tax break, like people that buy Priuses, and uh, the government didn't have to force me to do it. You know, with coercion, I just did it, you know, on my own volition, and uh, anybody can uh, anybody can make the decision to reduce their their carbon footprint. Oh, and one other thing, a quick, quick quick little announcement I forgot as well. There's a new bookstore opening in Bridge Store, a uh, Bridgeport called Tangible Books. This should be open in October, and it's being opened by the guy that originally founded Myopic Books in Wicker Park. Now he sold myopic books uh, about 12 years ago and, and moved away to raise his kids in Southern Illinois. But now he's coming back as kids are older and they can get into a good school in Chicago somewhere. It must be a private school. And so now he's going to open up this bookstore in Bridgeport. And there's a story in the current uh, issue of the reader about it. So Charlie might be interested in it. I think it's going to be on Halstead Street somewhere. You got a storefront and it's being uh, modified right now. And uh, he has a GoFundMe page set up as well. Can't remember the guy's name, but like I said, it's, there's a big article about it in the current issue of the reader. Okay, that's it. Okay, it's actually 3324 South Halstead that's going on. It's, right. not, open yet. it's not open yet though, right? No, it's not an old super. It's a supermarket that used to be one of them warehouse. Food okay, it's supposed to. See, he's going to have a, a big inventory. I understand. Well, hopefully he'll have an online presence too, and a couple of rooms where he can have author talks. I don't think any of my neighbors have read a book in ten years. A lot of people I know are still reading books, Charlie. 
not my neighbors. Well, guess what, Charlie? You know, their their books are being more. <laughs> you haven't met my neighbors. Yeah, I've known some of your neighbors, and they're actually some of them are pretty neat. Uh, I don't haven't met your loony one next door that you keep talking about, but uh, I know you got kind of one run above you in a sense, but never mind. All right, I'm just gonna simply say this, you know, and Todd, I just, you know, I I I, I like Michael Schellenberger, you know, the one who who uh, became over, you know, and the thing about the the thing is is that you're not gonna replace the world energy consumption with renewable energy. They're in crisis because they're making electricity more expensive. The subsidies are expiring and projects are starting to be blocked by wildlife conservationists and local community. In Germany, for example, just 35 wind turbines were installed last year. The country needs to install 1400 per year to meet its climate change targets. While our good old climate change person, Greta Thunberg, is sailing with wind power to the Sustainability Summit in New York, the German wind power industry is sailing into the doldrums. The halting of wind deployment in Germany has resulted in the industry of shedding 25,000 jobs over the last year. The thing is, the same is happening in California. The grid operator increasingly must pay neighboring states to take the state's excess solar electricity and cut off power from solar farms on sunny low demand days. Experts say the deployment of industrial wind energy in the United States is likely to stall when, key energy, when the key wind energy subsidy, known as the production tax credit or PTC, expires. Renewable advocates say the cost will eventually come down. Subsidies will be renewed and state mandates will kick in enough to save the industrial wind and solar industries. But it's unlikely to happen just because of its economics. The thing is, it takes, a, it takes about 750 times as much land as it does a nuclear power plant to build wind turbines. And they effectively got all that steel and all that other stuff, and it's not environmentally sustainable. Around the world, renewables are making electricity more expensive despite years of promises that the advocates would come down. Germany electricity consumers will have to pay higher subsidies to producers of green electricity in the next two years. In Australia, increasingly regularity with which wholesale prices are sinking below zero during sunny and windy days is being more than canceled out by more frequent high prices, defying expectations and softening the level overall in their free electricity market. You know, the thing is, is that uh, there's been a lot of warm and fuzzy feelings saying, oh yeah, it's going to be wind and solar and we're going to save the planet and all this stuff. What you got to understand is that, uh, you know, what you have to understand is that uh, nuclear is probably the only source that will get us off of fossil fuels. The point is, is that we're going to need to build these nuclear 4.0 type reactors or the small subsidized thorium based molten salt power. That's probably the only real sustainable way that I can see enough energy being produced to maintain an advanced industrial society, which is what we all want. If you look at a website called roadmap to nowhere.com there's a complete uh it's a complete rebuttal to another study given by um uh by by another group that was advocated that they say 100 renewables you know the thing is when the, if the amount of a, a, a if the amount of money it's going to take to switch to an all grid Thing, and with, a, with an all grid thing with the amount of storage capacity going to need it and the amount of uh, solar panels and wind farms, which must also be recycled after 20 years, because that's about the length of what a solar panel does. So it'll be scrapped and replaced. You also have a lot of toxic chemicals that go into their production. And most of it's being made in China right now. When you ask anybody who's near a solar plant over there, they don't like them. Now, again, I will say that nuclear power 
does produce radioactive wastes and toxins. But we're not actively recycling the waste that we already have, which basically means fuel reprocessing and other types of things that are coming on board and the development of new types of reactors. The nuclear how do you, power how do you industry, reprocess nuclear waste? It's simple, Charlie. When you only got 5% of the it's uranium easy. built in you got two a crops, for 10 million years. No, you don't. You burn it off in another type of reactor. When you get rid of the long acting actinites, wake up and smell the coffee. You don't know what you're talking about with that stuff. You're stuck in the, you keep your mind stuck on the old fashioned nuclear power plants. And the thing is, is that when you look at some of this stuff, China is doing it. They'll have, they'll have these reactors commercialized within just very short time. And, you know, the thing is you can get a lot more power out of a nuclear plant than you can with a wind and solar plant. Now, I'm not saying that wind and solar are all that bad, but in order to really replace fossil fuels, you're going to need something just as big, just as powerful, and just as centralized. Is, 30. You need 30. is this an argument for dirty energy? It's not dirty energy, Charlie. It's a lot cleaner than oil and gas, which is what you're going to be using anyway. Besides that nuclear waste is the type of waste we want, highly concentrated and contained, and it doesn't affect the environment. Anyway, enough said for me. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for listening to me. All right, Todd, uh, anybody else have a re rebuttal tonight? Ellen? Dan, uh, Doug, uh, Tim, Tim, I, I've been very tired. Um, I was at something else. And so I came in late. Um, but, um, I just want to say, um, uh, I, I know people always jump around at these things. There are a lot of arguments. Uh, I appreciate you just talking about the, um, uh, thorium reactors. I know I still haven't had time to really try to figure that angle out myself. Um, uh, oh. I, I meant to say, uh, Tim, I, I meant to say, Tim, uh, Todd, as far as uh, um, you have really done a great job of presenting yes. uh, the environmental uh, movement, and you've been very uh, low key. Uh, you've been very uh, serious. You've been presenting facts, um, and I've learned a lot. I appreciate it very much. I'm an environmentalist for a long time in my life. I can't ever remember not being an environmentalist. I was with the Citizens Party early. Uh, in Illinois here in Chicago, the Chicago chapter had Clinton Young and Studs Terkel as two very major people in it. At the time, I was willing to go with a third party, an environmental party. We ran, ran Barry Commoner for president. Uh, I think you're too young to remember that, um, but that was one of the first times when uh, a real environmentalist was a presidential candidate, uh, and I was working on that early campaign uh, in 1980. Of course, we got wiped out by uh, Reagan, and of course we got, uh, we really got our, our wings clipped by uh, a guy named Anderson, um, a, a Republican, which cra as crazy as it sounds, he, he, he ran on a uh, raising the uh, gas gasoline tax like an environmentalist would, would request at that time, which was extremely um, forward thinking when you think of what uh, the uh, Europeans did. Um, but, uh, but he went down in flames too but he, took, he stole some of our thunder at that time. And now I'm not anywhere near ever suggesting a third party again with the current situation with no uh, universal uh, instant runoff, uh, that it doesn't work. But uh, I just wanna say, I appreciate your presentation very much. I just joined up on your, on your website, uh, 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 put in my uh, email and um, I'll be looking at that in future. And uh, um, I, I'm open to all things anything that will help uh, save the earth from catastrophe. And um, uh, that's what we all have to be on board for. Um, corporate America is, and of course, a tremendous, tremendous obstacle to that. And people have talked about these corporations and uh, uh, you presented me with at least two concrete things. I know now that I've been going to all these in Target, but or Target, uh, depending on your <laughs> preference. Uh, and I'll, be going to them more now that I realize they're at the high, higher end of your um, uh, seal of approval. Uh, so at least uh, then I'll be staying away from Walmart, but uh, <laughs> for the most more, more staying away from Walmart. So appreciate it very much. I know it's late. Uh, take care. Uh, good luck. Um, 
Hey, Doug. Um, uh, John Anderson ran as an independent for president. He had previously been a, a congressman, I think, in, in Illinois as a Republican. But when he ran for president, he was an independent. I yeah, he ran as an independent, but he was a Republican. He, he was a Republican. He was what you call a moderate Republican. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I was actually uh, campaigning for him. And uh, when he came out with that 50 cent a gallon gas tax, that just totally threw ice water on the whole campaign, you know, I I called I called called down to the headquarters and complained about it, but you know they no he he stuck with it. Now I, I was stuck with a whole bag of uh, Anderson buttons that I couldn't give away. I don't I don't even know what happened to him. I don't know if I threw him away or what, but nobody. What happened is what happened is he just blew us out of the water. Citizens Party, as we called yeah. our party, it was yeah. It it was was no, nobody else would, would that, that fifty cent a gallon gas. Just like I think six, he was. I think he was asking for a higher gas tax than that. Uh, I was. I was fifty cents a gallon. It was fifty cents a gallon. And I said that just that just three completely threw ice. At, at any rate, he was a maverick. What do you call a maverick candidate? Um, and uh, it's, I agree. It's a problem that he wasn't a real environmentalist. Um, but um, uh, in any case. Uh, as because he had more name recognition, of course, uh, uh, I think he got something like seven percent of the vote. And Commoner only got like a half a percent or a quarter yeah, percent. Yeah, he got yes, oh. he, he got six point six. Okay, well, I was close. I, I'm just going by memory here. I didn't look anything up, but um, the fact is that um, um, politically, um, because of all the money in politics, which of course is one of the terrible sins. Um, of what the Supreme Court did to our society and um, what, um, you know, the, the Democrats, um, including uh, uh, Clinton and Obama, just not being strong enough um, to try to fight these guys off, um, the corporate control and the, the, um, the corporation just wanting to continue business as usual and owning uh, politicians. Uh, that's been the real, the real problem. And uh, I, I just have hopes. Uh, for Biden, I, I see some of the, um, the progressive, his, his new progressiveness uh, maybe going down in flames with Manchin and Cinnamon being bought off. Um, I don't know what happened. I, I'd like to see the Justice Department do an investigation, really. I'd like to see, I'd like to see if there's bribery involved. Um, uh, I don't know that Biden's strong enough. He, he, he brought in an attorney general who's just a guy to use the term that Trump used, low energy. Um, and um, we needed somebody stronger to really go after these malefactors and, uh, and really call it what it is. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm saddened in some sense, but I'm buoyed up by Todd, uh, his presentation, his uh, matter of using facts and his uh, uh, calmness and all of this. There's a lot of people in the environmental movement that have their hair on fire. And uh, because uh, the world is kind of seeming to go up in flames, uh, California, Oregon, especially, um, uh, with the drought out there and everything, and um, and of course the ignorance and the, the obstructionism of uh, horrible states like Texas and uh, Florida now being run by Death Santis. Um, so we have lots of problems. Um, it's hard to um, know. Uh, in the future, maybe everything will be known. Um, whether nuclear power in some uh, uh, unique and new creative ways, like with the thorium reactor, um, might be a, a bridge. And uh, I want to seem to be open to everything, even though um, um, I've, I've mainly been an anti, uh, anti nuclear power person. Um, but I do understand uh, Tim's arguments about um, how um, environmentally there are problems with the production um, of um, solar panels that they do use uh, toxins and, um, and that they, uh, this idea of only having a 20 year uh, lifespan, I, I wish that could be uh, improved. So improvements are gonna come in many ways, I hope. And uh, if we struggle through, it might be on a razor's edge, but uh, humanity has been on a razor's edge uh, if, uh, we go back anthropologically, uh, uh, we can go back to um, the volcanic eruption where they say like 90% of humans uh, were uh, killed off. Uh, I don't think, I don't remember if it was Tobor, it's one of those Indonesian um, volcanoes that nearly destroyed humanity. Um, 
So we've we've had times. I hope it doesn't get to ninety percent deaths uh, <laughs> from global warming. But uh, we've had worse times for humanity than we're looking ahead to. And uh, I I take Todd's optimism and uh, all right, let's let and hope for the best. Speak, thank right? thank you all very much for being on the program. All right. Well, uh, thanks everybody for hanging in there. Uh, I think we're near the end. So, uh, I, am I supposed to just say a few words yeah. for like two or three minutes, and that's that's good? Say whatever you want. Okay. That, looks, that sounds good. Um, well, thanks everybody for for taking part tonight. Um, I just heard a few things. I just thought I'd respond to a little bit to to close in terms of uh, renewable energy and its future, for example. Um, I think uh, we have to keep in mind that um, there are challenges to renewable energy, but at the same time, it, in Germany, uh, wind power actually surpassed coal as their primary source of energy in the last year. So it's actually continuing to grow. Um, and uh, when when Germany did shut down its nuclear power plants, at, at first there was a resurgence of coal, but now uh, there's a definite huge growth in wind power there that's uh, surpassed coal. The same thing happened in Japan, where when they shut down nuclear power plants, uh, at first they had an over-reliance on coal, but they've been building out their renewable energy as well, in particular solar. So we, we are seeing that progress actually being made, um, and we are seeing the cost of wind and solar go down appreciably, 80% uh, reduction in solar power costs over the last decade, which is phenomenal. Uh, in terms of the subsidies for renewable energy, just keep in mind that we've been subsidizing fossil fuels at a much greater rate for decades. So if we actually removed fossil fuel subsidies and uh, didn't subsidize anything, I think renewable energy would likely win. Um, but unfortunately, we continue to subsidize fossil fuels in this country um, and around the world. Uh, so that's one of our problems. And that's why we do need to continue to support wind and solar at the government level, because otherwise it makes it harder for them to be competitive with something that's so heavily subsidized in the first place. Um, so I think we really will see a tremendous growth in renewable power over the next couple of decades. If the federal government really supports that, I think it'll grow a lot faster and we'll see that we can get to 100% renewables in the next 20 years. If the federal government doesn't support that, it will take longer. Um, and that's the difference that's gonna happen. Um, but in any event, renewable power continues to grow all over the world. Um, I, would, I heard a couple of other things, one of which is in the past, the world has been warmer than it is now. And this is true. Um, but if you look at the charts and so forth, generally speaking, you're going back millions of years uh, including times when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, and when dinosaurs roamed the earth, the earth was much hotter. It was also much wetter than it is now. There was less land mass. Um, and in places we are now, we're tropical environments back then. So that's the dramatic difference. <laughs> um, we certainly don't want to get to that place. But even if the earth warms by just a few degrees centigrade, uh, it's going to dramatically change climates all over the world. And, and that's the problem that we face. Uh, and as a species and multiple other species, we're not gonna be able to adapt easily to rapid change like that in a short period of time. And that's the other piece is it's happening so fast. So we have to keep that in mind when we talk about global warming is the speed and scale of it. Uh, and also that the that human species has evolved in a rare moment when the climate was conducive to uh, our civilizations growing. Um, and we're disrupting that with climate change. A um, couple other quick things. Um, in terms of uh, racism in the United States, it is an issue that we look at as an organization. I really encourage people to read articles to understand structural and institutional racism in the United States and the impact on intergenerational wealth, particularly within Black families and how that affects those communities and individuals in those communities and their ability to uh, exist in our society, thrive in our society, and the disproportionate impact it has on their lifespan, uh, educational attainment, and so many other things. Um, if, uh, you know, as a country, we've had a policy of systematically steering wealth towards white people in this country, and it's well documented and you can read it 
very easily online. And I really encourage people to do so. It's so important to understand that facet of American society. Um, so, but, and so in general, just, um, I think it's really important as part of our mission of Green America to always combine the environment and social justice together. And I encourage everybody to do that in your work and in your lives in the world. So thank you for having me as a guest this evening. And uh, I hope you enjoy your future presentations. Thank okay. you, that was excellent. Yes, thank you. Come back. <laughs> right.